Well, I'm a fiction writer, and then that, that's, I, and I think we're here as a reality check. Art keeps us honest um, about about how badly we've screwed up, or about the few times when you get something right. Because as soon as you utter post-racial, it's just how it is you're, that we can utter racial these or make these marks of racial difference, and have it mean something to somebody else. But the culture in a novel is into a world in which you have to think. About to have it make sense. Not only process the language, but you have to create the world. Not only I've seen the images are there to some extent, ads in one sentence paragraph in your head. That's the beautiful thing about, about literary articles. As much as I think I might be putting stuff there, I can't control it. And that's kind of what raises is, by the way. The circuit is completed by the, by the, um, the reader. reader. Uh, it's not a word of art until somebody might it. Unless it's some specific person dealing with a specific issue in a specific context, I don't know what the talk about identity really is about. And that could be just because I'm dumb. Oh, I thought, okay. Uh, we just jumped head first into this shit. <laughs> what up, what, what up, what up? The fuck is up, everyone? We've been having, uh, you know, IT troubles. We said this uh, in the first take that we took, a little bit of a, a sort of... Lore. To the, Some deep the, lore. It's lore, whatever. Mm -hmm. This is uh, this is take two. Take one has been deleted forever. Yeah, that's Silmarillion. Yep. That's going to be in the Silmarillion. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we need an audio engineer. We need yeah, one. maybe. Maybe Honestly, yeah. if you're willing to work for free or like four dollars, or just drop some knowledge about like what is a quick and dirty way to uh, make this not suck shit, to make this polished, yeah, easily, where we don't have to know anything about technology that we can just yeah. basically give us the staples easy button I for was audio. Say, we need the easy button. That's what we need. Anyway, that's enough of our personal woes, production-wise. You've been hearing no them for a that. year almost. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, don't, I mean, I don't know. I, I kind of want to talk about my parents' divorce back in high school. <laughs> oh wow! <laughs> See, listen again. Patreon memory, only. lore. I just I carry a lot of guilt because I left kind of as it was happening, and my brothers had to bear the brunt of it. You know what I mean? They were younger than me, wow. so yeah. What do you think they would do if if they were to recount that story themselves about you and your perspective on it? Uh, that's a would good they question. Be mad? Do you think they would be mad? I don't think they would, would be they mad at me. Would they paint you in a sympathetic light? Uh, no, I don't think they would be mad at me because I think, I mean, they're both intelligent guys, and I think that they know that it was just kind of like the vagaries of of age and whatever, and like I just happened to not be there when like shit was going down, you know what I mean, for most of it. Well, you, you're not giving me a lot with my attempt at creating a parallel between the story device. Oh, you're talking about the book. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not actually talking about your personal history. No, nah, dude, I'm not trying to blow by. We can talk. About it. You want to talk fine. about it? No, no, okay. no, no. No, it's Patreon only. Patreon only. <laughs> oh, Patreon only. Speaking of, uh, subscribe to the Patreon. Patreon.com slash Spinecrackers. If you don't want to spend money, but, but, but by the way, we did just add a brand spanking new if you're if you're dilly dallying and and feeling like on the fence, ah, God, I don't know. Is all this bonus content worth it? Is it worth it to see Gabe struggle through reading Infinite Jest? Is it worth it to see preview pictures of the books that we're gonna read coming up, so you can read along and be our friend? Uh, Is it worth joining the Discord? You can dip your you can dip your toes in for a grand two bones a month. Not a grand, two bone. Two no, bones. not yeah, not two grand, not a not one thousand and two, just two. 
See how hard it is to communicate bones. linguistically? Ooh, Ooh, the book yeah. Language Ooh. language fails, as usual. <laughs> as Gabe is saying this, you should definitely also be hearing in your head, uh, in the eyes <laughs> of the angels. The poor Spinecrack boys. Far away from home <laughs> in a cold, dark hotel room. What a beautiful voice. That was a be- that brought me to tears almost, man. Wow. Asleep. And just like a sort of a, 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 a dog with huge gum, gunked up gummy eyes, but with a glaze over them that's really sparkly. That's, that's us if you and don't. That's us. If you don't subscribe to the Patreon. Yeah. Um, but for real, you know, we do post uh, uh, bonus pictures, bookshelf tours. I'm doing a, 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 a vlog series of me reading Infinite Jest right now. Um, which I'm not going to say anything about because you have to watch the videos. And we just added a new tier for $2 a month where you can join our Discord, talk to us, talk to other members. Guests of the show uh, are on there, and it's popping. It's fun. We post uh, music, songs that we're listening to, whatever. So if you're if you're on the fence about the Spinecrackers, uh, try the two bones a month. It's less than you spend on toilet paper, a lot less probably. Um, and uh, me. you <laughs> you might like it. Only the finest for Paul's hole. <laughs> <laughs> I like how Paul's hole is now in the spine cla- spine crackers lore. Yeah. Oh yeah, dude. It, it's going in the Silmarillion back pages. <laughs> 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 uh. So, it's um, better than those fucking bears that love rubbing their assholes oh my with God. paper all Don't the time. Don't even get me fucking that started on those worst. commercials, dude. Those are the worst. What is that, Charmin? Charmin. Yeah, Charmin. The worst commercials of Charmin. all time. Well, now they're CGI, yes. but they, they initially stole the, the uh, I think, the Frosty the Snowman animated feature film. God, Sort of creepy. like animation style to create like a, a, a faux coziness, and I hate it. And then the fucking heat miser just comes out their asshole. <laughs> yeah, if they use the wrong type of toilet paper, yeah. <laughs> no, those commercials are gross, dude. They're just like, oh, God, I have a bunch of dirty fucking sh- poop toilet paper in my butt, yeah. hairy butt, <laughs> bare asshole. It's disgusting. It's so gross. <laughs> like, that does not want to make me buy your toilet paper. <laughs> or make me, yeah. 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 Oh, is it supposed to be as soft as these bears? What do I know about these bears? You yeah, know I mean? yeah, these bears are savages, dude. You're making me think about bears a lot. <laughs> bears just, just... They don't even wipe their ass. They just fucking shove pine cones up it. Yeah. <laughs> Another cool stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, very very cool. Very cool. <laughs> um, All right, so... What we, yeah, what, what are we talking about? We are talking about uh, a book of your choosing, Gabe, so why don't you mm. run us uh, through the... the I don't know, the broad strokes of the thing. Yeah, okay. So this week we are talking about, uh, and bear with me, because the the title <laughs> of the book, oh, shit, bear. Charmin, bear. <laughs> From Jeez, now on. Jesus Christ. It's funny. Um, <laughs> because the title of the book is itself sort of confusing. The title of the book is Percival Everett by Virgil Russell, um, and the author is Percival Everett. So, and I know what you're thinking. Isn't Virgil Russell canceled for talking to an underage girl? In Texas? <laughs> <laughs> oh shit! Well, yes. it's not that. No, it is not that Virgil. Uh, <laughs> shout outs. No, not shout outs. We're, we don't support that. <laughs> That's the like, millionth time we've done that too. <laughs> how how epic would that be? If Virgil's comeback was an appearance on our show. Oh, I uh, read a book with you about that. Actually, <laughs> but I'm so he's glad. Not Canadian. Well, he sort of is. <laughs> He's whatever. <laughs> anyway, Virgil, if you're out there, dude, um, this is a safe space, sort of. We will ask you about all that shit, but... Yeah, you will be hard-grilled about yeah. all that shit first. But um, you can come on if you want to. Yeah, but if, then we'll talk about David Foster Wallace or whatever. Yeah, whatever the fuck books you read. Um, okay, so so this is my choice. I picked this book. This is um, uh, Everett's... I, I don't know where this falls exactly. He's like like he's he's a pretty prolific author. He's written like twenty plus novels, like twenty three or something. A lot. Um, and I, I I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this was his twentieth novel. Uh, and it came out in twenty thirteen, and um, 
he has a reputation. Uh, he's a professor of English at USC. He has a reputation of being kind of like um, very formally kind of like and, and sort of attitudinally postmodern, very self-referential, whatever. I think, Paul, you and I were talking about this a little bit uh, before we started recording, and I know you watched some interviews and stuff with Everett. Mm-hmm. This book may be the, the the sort of apex of this tendency in in his writing of of kind of playful self referentialism and and these various kind of postmodern tendencies, um, yeah. and obviously we'll talk about that when we start talking about the book in more detail. Uh, but um, yeah, I, I wanted to read it because I, I had heard his name uh, bandied about a little bit here and there. Uh, not a well-known or popular author, which is something that I want to talk about, even even within the kind of like, uh, yeah. you know, fancy, let's read hard, weird books, book two, books to gram sphere. And, and I want to talk about that a little bit later. Um, but I had heard his name a few times and I kind of wanted to get uh, some, some, obviously we've read a few uh, African-American authors on this show so far but you know i wanted to kind of pad those numbers a little bit i suppose um it's probably a very bad way to put it but you know it's like it's i I mean i think what is uh very interesting is that with with the choices that have been made so far with uh most of these you know black writers uh it's not like padding numbers so much like it's crazy that they're not in the conversation it's like a genuine surprise upon reading the work that uh yeah that they fly so under the radar for for what it is that they've done you know what i mean and yes and well it's especially actual for genuine, like, like uh, what is going on especially for base cathedral with nathaniel mackey mm-hmm. yeah and I, mm-hmm. and I would say this one too i mean no spoilers but i like this book a lot and it like what you're saying gabe it seems like it should be in the spectrum of booktubers and Instagram tubers and all that, it's like, why aren't people reading this book? I, uh, yeah, or this author? Yes, I, I think that was definitely part of my mo- my motivation. And yeah, I'll slight spoiler alert or whatever. Like, there is no reason that I can think of that people are talking about people like Delillo and whoever, and they're not talking about Percival Everett and and his body of work. I'll pu- I'll just put that on the table. I think there's some shit there that's probably problematic, and maybe we can get into it a little bit more later. But he need you know he, he needs to be in the conversation, and I think I was sort of trying to go out of my way because it, you know you read a book like this or you read a book like Base Cathedral or some of these other books we've read, and you do wonder like what the fuck am I missing that's out there that nobody's talking about? Yeah, and yeah. that was sort of my experience reading this book. Um, Shout outs to Grey Wolf Press, right? Shout outs to Grey Wolf being... Press out of Minneapolis. Yep. Mm-hmm. I think they've published a, a number of his books, if not all of them. I used to live right maybe like two miles from from Grey Wolf. Knew it well. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> that it was there. And it I knew was it was there. there. By the twins, right by the twins stadium. Shout mm-hmm. out to the twins. They suck. They do? They do better. <laughs> yeah, they're horrible. Sad. Just sad. <laughs> Sad. Yeah. Sad. <laughs> Sad. Um, so, okay, so the other uh, onus that falls on me as the chooser of this book is to describe the plot, which is a bit um, annoying in this case. We'll cut you some slack on this one. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the, the setup of the book, the sort of conceit, is a son going to visit his aging father in an, you know, an old folks' home. I don't know what the term is for that. Uh the you know old folks home or retirement home yeah whatever nursing home and um from there it kind of spins uh, pretty quickly out of control where the the father kind of starts relating a story to his son that he couches as here's a story that you would have written if you were a writer (laughs) Right, <laughs> the, the beginning yeah. of the of, yeah. of, of the sort of novel, and then from there, it 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 spirals in a bunch of directions where you quickly lose track of who's narrating, who is sort of uh, listening, who is sort of acting as which character in this 
kind of impromptu narrative that evolves and and the characters' names and their roles change over time. And there's a bunch of kind of interwoven stories. Uh, th- so, so there's a story about a um, physician who is called upon to become the sort of like family doctor for this family of like obese meth head drug dealers. Uh, and he's paid in antique camera equipment. There's a story uh, about about a, a, a sort of like l- like lonely rancher who's visited by kind of like this uh, also lonely divorced veterinarian who treats his horse. Um, and uh, there's a story about a an artist who gets a surprise visit from a young woman who claims to be his uh, un- lo- like un- like long lost unknown daughter, who also wants to be his apprentice, um, and that's just in the first half. And the second half of the book becomes this, this series of vignettes that also forms a, a semi cohesive story about um, a group of people, maybe the narrator's father. Uh, All that stuff from the first half is basically gone too. By the way, once you get to the second half, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it it's it, gone. it just kind of poof. It just kind of vaporizes. At, like the book's divided into three parts: um, Hesperus, Phosphorus, and Venus. Yeah. All of which are names for Venus that were used. Hesperus and Phosphorus were used by the ancient Greeks, or I guess Romans, maybe I, f- I forget, to refer to. A uh, an object in the sky that they saw in the morning, Hesperus, and then Phosphorus that they saw later in the evening at night. Unbeknownst to them, they were the same celestial object, namely the planet Venus. And so the we'll talk a lot about that. I think. Oh, is going that forward. a philosophical like thought experiment? I've heard that in. A, yes. Yeah, I heard that in a lecture by the the death. Uh, Shelley Kagan. Shelly Kagan, yeah. Shout out to Shelly Kagan if you want to come on the podcast. Yeah, uh, bro. Whoa. So the Hesperus Phosphorus uh, example, and this is why, uh, spoiler alerts, if he you've been, it, it, yeah, <laughs> I love this book, and also if you've been in the Discord, you saw that we were going to have to have this conversation again, but um, if you want to talk about difficult books, in terms of like esoteric background knowledge that helps you understand this book... There's more here than almost anything I've ever read. So even those section distinctions, Hesperus, Phosphorus, and Venus, the 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 it's, it's not quite a thought experiment, but it's example. The example that Paul's referring to comes from Saul Kripke's uh, Naming and Necessity, which is one of the most important philosophical texts of the 20th century. Um, with, without getting too deep into the weeds here, Kripke... It's a work of philosophy of language, and he's interested in the role of proper names, i.e., you know, capital nouns like, you know, for example, Matt or Gabe or Paul or Austin, Texas or, uh, you know, uh, Athens, Greece, right? Like like names that refer to a specific place. Um, and he's interested in the way that those terms function linguistically. And his... Example of Hesperus, Phosphorus as both terms that refer to Venus is specifically meant to um, be a a challenge or friendly addendum to the Kantian um, synthetic a priori and and, uh, analytic a priori sort of distinction. So Kant believed that there was no such thing as synthetic a priori truths, i.e., Truths that were true by definition, but required experience to understand, right? So Kant believed that all definitional truths could be understood without any experience of the world. I know I'm already getting into the weeds here, but I do. No, this is actually but, important. I think. But, but I do think you really have to with this book, because I think, Paul, you mentioned before we started recording that Everett studied math or something at some point in his life as an undergraduate. Yeah. Undergraduate, he was like a math major. And that totally checks out, because with his knowledge of his knowledge of philosophy that he displays in this book is very, very deep. Um, and, and something that I, I probably read... 10 like popular reviews of this text in various outlets npr and washington post and 
you know, New York Times and whatever, whatever. Nobody mentioned any of this shit. And it seems pretty clear to me that like 70% of what he was doing in this book went, just went straight up over everybody's head. Um, Including it, mine. But I was saying uh, that I, I knew there was something deeper going on while I was reading it. But it didn't take away from the reading experience either, though. Yeah. Like, it, yeah. But even even just knowing, right, that that you are letting something just, you know, go over your head that you know you could pursue, right, is not... I don't know if that's always the case with a lot of these reviewers who also kind of like us on occasion have a, have a quick turnaround date in terms of how long they need to... For sure. ...to engage with something before speaking of it. Well, and the only reason I know any of this shit is because I'm I'm I actually have training in philosophy. Yeah, we're um, gonna be leaning on you heavy. <laughs> yeah, I'm here for it because this is I, I actually you know ha- have have a decent background in some of this shit. Um, but but yeah, I, I I think that you know, and again, like I said, like in terms of the the, the conversation about what makes a book difficult, in order to understand this book, I I, I don't want to say that. <laughs> But in order to get potentially the full scope of whatever it is trying to do here, you need to have read Frega, which is a pun that he deploys. Uh, a number of times in the text he uses the, the, the word Afrega, A-F-R-E-G-E, yeah. which is just comes off as kind of a funny, um, you know, neologism or typo or something as you're reading it. But, of course, Gottlob Frege was one of the most well-known and influential philosophers of logic and philosophers of language and uh, talked a lot about these ideas of of, um, proper names and natural kinds. And Kripke uh, developed his work a lot in naming and necessity when he sort of was sort of going through uh, these examples of of Venus. And the other example that... um, Everett deploys in this book is uh, Cicero and Tully, right? Because both of those uh, terms were used to refer to the same person at various points historically. And so the idea is that it is, to get back to the point I was trying to make earlier about the, the, the way this fits into the Kantian categorization, Hesperus and Phosphorus refer to the same object necessarily, according to, to Kripke. It's a necessary truth. Uh, it could not be otherwise. But it is synthetic in the sense that it requires experience to understand that those two terms refer to the same thing. I don't want to go too deep into this, but but know that this is a sort of relevant and important reference in the history of philosophy. So that's that. I was I was I was <laughs> thinking good. about um, background. I was thinking about also, like, I, I know I just sort of flippantly mentioned David Foster Wallace, but I, I genuinely believe that a lot of the things dealt with here were things that kind of obsessed Wallace, including the 100%, fact that he, 100%. He, wrote, he wrote a book about, like, Infinity, which included Frege, and he was discussing set theory and things, once again, that are also fucking over my head. Um but yeah, a lot of a lot of that just sort of uh, infinite recursion. Uh, yeah, I don't know, like like and, and, just and stuff just... that was stuff that was like inf- influencing one of probably the most well known literary names out there. Uh, and this person deals with it uh, as well and with aplomb and uh, doesn't have to also die about it. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he also. <laughs> <laughs> F in the chat. It. F in the chat. Well, he also does it with a lot of flair and humor too. Like I don't, like Gabe, uh, your, you know, philosophical knowledge is definitely helpful. But if you know people that are listening to this who haven't read the book, which is probably many, if not all, it it is a really accessible novel. I would say. And I mean, it was difficult to read, but there's a lot of just like really beautiful passages and writings, and almost there's poems in it. There's uh great character interactions and it's funny as fuck as well it's like this this, this might be the funniest book we've read for the show kitchen my, sink in my book. opinion yeah a hundred percent like an actual kitchen sink book just like whatever will get the point across at some I, point 
I don't think I would call it accessible in the sense that there's no uh, plot per se. Like, you know, like it's readable. Like, for example, yeah, you know, OK, like better. this fell in a very weird place for me personally, because we have just we just are we're just coming off the McElroy episode. And that book was syntactically insane to read. Yeah. Right. Like just the way the sentences were constructed and shit. Um, this book is not like that, but it's difficult in other ways. It's difficult in the references. It's difficult in some of the concepts that it's dealing with. And also, uh, shout outs to the patrons. I just dropped my second uh, v- vlog on reading Infinite Jest today, actually. Um, and you already brought up Wallace, Matt. Yeah. So uh, I-, I think that, like, it, it, it's this weird triangulation for me. Every book is a sequel. Every book is a prequel. That's our mantra. But between Infinite Jest and Cannonball and this text, it formed this weird triangle for me in terms of my recent reading experiences. You found a Triforce, and therefore you're finding the uh, the, the power of the fourth <laughs> triangle right. within yeah. the Triforce. Yeah. Exactly. I... Uh, I want to take I want to take it back to a, a somewhat superficial thing real quick, just because. Percival, listen, you're 64. You're not getting any younger, and people need to read these books. And uh, I just like to say the cover the cover is like uh, M- the M C Escher two hands drawing each other. Yep. Uh, but can I just say, uh, Gray Wolf or whoever, God fucking damn, please someone do a new take on the covers for these books because they look like shit. Step up. Yeah. It's fucking (laughs) ugly. And it, it, and it looks like a baby stupid book. It's, uh, if someone could just make baller covers for these books, it would change the game. And I'm, I don't mean to reduce it to that, but, but you're not wrong, dude. I mean, I think that, you know, it's a, it's a sad truth in kind of like book internet kind of hype, not even just on the internet, but just people pulling books off a shelf it's a sad truth that, like, oh, does this book look uh, intelligent? Does this book look hype? Does this mm-hmm. book look look fucking dope? And it definitely doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it yeah. doesn't look hype. And it should. It like and it fire. should. And it should because this shit is fucking hot fire. Yeah. So, so that that's just. I just real quick wanted to say, the covers to these books are atrocious. It, and it, it makes. Of course, it's, that's not on Everett, right? Like, that's on the publisher and whoever. No, that's a general just sort of cry for someone to do an actual solid pass on making these It does look like a Midwest objects. mom in, in Minneapolis working at Grey Wolf made this cover, like, 40 <laughs> minutes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Just, like, flat. Yeah, that flat style, that flat sort of graphic designer style. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely a bummer, and it does not do justice to the text at all. all um, right. Just I had to say it for some reason. So no, 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 no. I'm glad you did because I I I, I think it's I think it's uh, unreasonably and sadly important. <laughs> you yeah. know, like it, it just it just is. Not even sadly, I think people should. Uh, should take pride in graphic design if you're going to do it. You know? No, 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 of course. I just mean like it's it's kind of a sad fact about the world that like the books that 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 get hype or what like I mean, I don't know. I think it's it, it, some not uh 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 uh, what's the term I'm looking for? Like some not insignificant chunk of that is due to their appearance and the way they're designed and all that and marketing. Oh yeah, I'm guilty of the judge the judgment. Yeah, of course. Yeah, so, like all Simonon book covers look awesome. The new ones, and the old ones too. They yeah, really yeah. Shout out to Penguin. They, they've been crushing it with those Simonon covers. Even the old uh, New York Review of Books ones are amazing. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, I mean that that that's basically it for me in terms of uh, the the plot and the structure and all that. I mean, the one thing that I will flag that I that I want us to kind of keep in mind is that. Thinking about this philosophical kind of superstructure that Everett sets up, right? The Hesperus, Phosphorus, and Venus as being the three um, sections of the book. The whole point, if you're reading Kripke and and uh, Frege, not Frege, but Kripke's sort of synthesis uh, of the, that those sorts of discussions, is that all three of those terms are the same thing. And so, one thing that I was thinking while reading the book is. 
how are all of these three sections, which, as Matt already alluded to, are fucking wildly different? Um, like, the first section is a bunch of, like, un- disconnected stories that seem to be the ramblings of someone who's, like, drifting in and out of, like, lucid consciousness. The middle section is this... Um, more or less coherent narrative about it's sort of like a one flew over the cuckoo's nest type thing whereas these people in this uh, old folks home um you know planning revenge against a group of uh, abusive orderlies it's and also the, a, nat, a nat turner analog yes right yes nat turner comes up a, sh- a bunch in this book um and then the final section is kind of this amalgam of there's it, it it becomes multimedia right there's photographs and like uh poetry and like it just becomes yeah. kind of this like it's its own thing and so one of the things that i was thinking about while i was reading this and we don't have to talk about it right now but just something that's kind of keep in your back pocket in what ways are all of these sections actually the same thing because that is the hesperus phosphorus venus that's the payoff of that is that all of those words refer to one and the same object. And so I wonder what that object of reference might be for all of these apparently disparate sections of the text. Well, I think first of all, like uh, one of the big things with the shifting identities of who it is that's even writing the book is that uh, it's both, right? There's a just sort of necessarily kind of, uh, Schrodinger like <laughs> superposition in in language where you can say a lot of things and there's throughout the entire book there's just all of these instances where people are are uttering a word that has a kind of vague meaning and people take it to mean the wrong thing than what the sayer intended or whatever you know what I mean uh, so there's probably just that and there's also probably just the doing okay so. At the very beginning, right? It's dedicated. Is that just Percival Everett's full name, or did his father actually die? I I believe it, that the book is dedicated to his actual father, who did actually die. But you're right to bring it up because his father is also named Percival Everett. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he's the I, I second. Did... He's he's Percival Everett Jr. Uh, I don't know if he's a junior, but the middle names might be different. But I, but I do think his father was, I, from what I understand, the book was dedicated to his actual father who did actually die, who was actually named Percival Everett. Like, I have, a, I have a younger brother who has the same name as my father, but a different middle name. Um, so, okay. I, I just, did, I didn't know if that was also itself some sort of fiction, but it seems like occasionally when he is um, being the most surface... Uh, it's, it's about, it's about kind of like grief and his, and his dad, basically. Yeah, definitely. Kind of just kind of covering all of it. And that, and that just kind of being maybe the very, the very specific and basic, you know, in input to the creation of the whole thing. Yeah, I think that's right, and I'll, and I'll say like maybe I'm putting too many of my cards at the table too early here, but I uh, like I said, I read a bunch of reviews of this book, and a lot of them came off very very dumb dumb to me, because they were basically just sort of saying like, oh, at the core of this book is just a, a good story about a, a son with guilt and his father and and grief I I and, and, and 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 stuff like that, and I wish he had just told that story more directly, yeah. and I'm like. Yep you're just too dumb to get the rest of what he was doing. That's kind of my, my that was that, in, yeah. yeah, that's kind of my intuitive reaction. You, you, you saw some of that too, Paul. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I read that exact same review. It was like, I think it was like halfway through, I was done reading the book. I read it and I was like, that just, it does just seem lazy. Like they're at that point. I even looked up and knew that he had majored in math and that gave me enough insight to be like, I know that there's something more to this that, I just don't know what's happening and he's exploring something personal to him in terms of like the relationship with him and his father, which I assume, I I mean, I assume this book has some autobiographical tendencies, right? We can kind of assume that. I I think Um, that's fair. And I did listen to one uh, interview with him on YouTube that was like 50 minutes long. That was really awesome. Um, The interviewer was 
horrendous, but he is he they is almost the always man. are. <laughs> oh, he had the worst voice. Uh, I can't even it was it was just ridiculously bad. Asking him stupid questions, but he is the fucking man. And when when uh the interviewer asked him like basically what this book in particular was about and what it meant to him, he uh he said that it was the most fun he's had writing any book because it, it, he kind of let loose in his or with his ideals, with his knowledge of philosophy. And it was like, you know, kind of therapeutic for him too, because it was about this uh, father son relationship he had. So it was like all of almost like, I guess, like all of the, uh, I haven't read any of his other books, but it seems like he put all of it, all of like his themes and what he likes to explore into this one. And it was just like a huge conglomerate of everything that he's interested in. Yeah, I, 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 I think I didn't mean to make a, a uh, sort of cheap assessment of the through line of debt of like a, a, a son grieving their father. I, I, I don't think it. I, not to interrupt you, Matt. I don't think it's cheap because I do think the book works on that level too. Like you do get those moments and that sense of like that 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 very base level of like the father son relationship and and the familial relationship in general and and, and grief and guilt. And sort of like the the weight of memory and stuff. So it, I I don't think it's a small point. Like it's I'm I'm talking about all this a big philosophical shit. But the book book is also about those very simple kind of like relationships, and, and it works on that level as well. I would argue. Right. Well, it's just that it can be all of that stuff if you if you're primed with the with the sort of uh, philosophical background that he has uh, or you read a lot or you're just kind of like a smart person who's trying to like sort of bash their head against, you know, life and its meaning. Uh, and then ultimately, right. You're, you're just hit with the death of a parent or just some sort of tragedy that it for foregrounds that I, I, I understand the motivation for then, if you got all this theoretical ammunition now as you've as you've tried to tackle and you know quote unquote prepare yourself for death as one of the you know motivations for studying philosophy is is said to be about it's like this unloading seems to happen and i and i feel like i've seen it in other writers too where it's like okay what what do i know all this bullshit for like what am i saying what do i what am i doing what do i mean yes well, and that's uh, good, yeah, you just bring and, all of your education to bear on that. And 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 of course, the father figure in the novel has uh, some views on this, which she kind of goes back and forth on. Where it's at, at some point he's like, uh, "Yeah, baby, basically means nothing. It's fucking pointless." <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. In that interview, he talks about um, you know the interview was asking him like his what he thinks of his uh, philosophical philosophical knowledge. And he basically thought that, I mean, Gabe, you seem to think that he had, like, a pretty vast knowledge. It seems like it after your, your uh, intro, but there are some kind of There are some deep cuts in here. Yeah. He was kind of just like, yeah, I, I feel actually pretty stupid. Like, I don't know very much. Um, I, w I would just like to explore what I know, and I know I have limitations. And I, he said something like he gets to the end of the book and, like, writes it kind of searching for some th something, and then when he finishes it, a book he like w comes away with no more questions but he's also like I don't, i'm okay with that but so you know what he also uh, talks about is 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 uh and i i'm i I'd, I'd meant to highlight it but there was a passage about like ignorance he talks about ignorance a lot and like uh yes and how the vastness of the ignorance ah fuck i'm gonna f I'm, I'm fucking butchering it but like it's just, just sort of like within that vastness is uh is kind of, is the spiritual counterpoint to, I think the kind of performatively atheist character of the father, who is potentially his concoction, the son's co concoction, maybe. Right. You know what I mean? Like, uh, he's he's like f talking about how much he loves Bertrand Russell, and uh, how much he's annoyed at Wittgenstein, which is a whole other thing. That's the, you know. Uh, so yeah, the the, the that sort of. Um, lack of knowing which you know 
whatever it, that what, that Socrates, right? Like uh, the wise I, person knows that they don't know, etc. You can you can feel me <laughs> 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 sort of reaching my Sorry my you, uh, right. The wise person doesn't know. Um, being kind of, I guess, the still operative thing here, like it's almost an inspiring quality. The amount that you don't know, like, yes, yeah, that's all yeah, I got. no. I think that's right. I mean, and I think you know, just just to the you you know, you mentioned Bertrand Russell, and I think the the Percival Everett by Virgil Russell in the title yeah. is, is yeah. significant because, of course, one of the other characters or references that gets uh, constant shout outs throughout the book is Dante and um, Dante's Virgil specifically. Right. And so Virgil Russell is a sort of like amalgam of, of Virgil, Dante's Virgil and Bertrand Russell. Right. And, uh, y- y- you know, I, 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 I like, yeah, Dante comes up a bunch of times in a bunch of ways. And there's some like um, section titles that are some like deep cut references to uh, some Dante texts and there's the obviously the whole book is very deeply concerned with death right um because the father is kind of uh, uh constantly reflecting on on death and his life and he's by the end of the book i'm not sure if he's been in a coma the whole time and maybe it was uh, maybe he was talking to himself right <laughs> like uh, yeah i'm not sure maybe this... he's, his body is it's like plus or whatever his body is no longer even relevant <laughs> right you know, exactly it's all mind so it's like it, it by the end of the book it's not even clear if his son was ever even there or if he was just talking to him maybe this is the way i read it anyway because by the end of the book he it comes up that this person might be in a coma in which case he probably isn't speaking to anybody and maybe all of this was happening <laughs> in his head, I guess, that his son was visiting him and he was writing this book for his son that he thinks his son would have written if his son wrote books. It's like... (laughs) 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 But his son son isn't even there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, it's... it's, What I got the feel... And uh, we're going to have to talk uh, about the sort of... uh, the modernist, postmodernist thing which is the other favored talking point to like lit people. But like, yeah, buddy. Yeah. The Virgil Russell, I, I, what I liked a lot about this particular reading experience was, was that struggle, which I felt was like the marriage of, you know, uh, the old wisdom, spirituality, the old, like sort of, I don't know. Christian almost sort of uh, uh, you know Virgil leading somebody through hell and 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 the old thought forms and ways and metaphors and ways of conceiving uh, reality in its entirety you know and then like someone like Bertrand Russell and his ilk you know the the sort of I would say probably British utilitarians and rationalists and analytic philosophers like Wittgenstein who are who well are okay to... small correction. But sure, sure, sure. not not a correction, but uh, Wittgenstein and Russell hated each other. Wittgenstein oh, li- literally attacked Russell with a uh, fire poker. He should have. <laughs> That's good stuff. Uh, okay, I didn't know that. That's funny. <laughs> well, okay, so th- I guess Russell then, because even the dad doesn't like Wittgenstein. The dad's like, he keeps calling him the that asshole when he's talking about Wittgenstein. <laughs> uh but Russell, as somebody who you know was was a big believer in being able to think essentially why right you're like your way out of out of uh human problems but yes but I also think that uh, the the part of the dad's hatred of Wittgenstein is that he hates that Wittgenstein was right, which is that right. there's there you know there's a moment w- way late in the book and I'm not going to read the whole se- the whole thing where there's this discussion about how language is 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 essentially our only God, right? Language is this fully encapsulating thing that like, no matter what we do, we can't escape and can't get out of. And, and language is, um, it's always a step ahead of us, I think is the way that he puts it. Yeah. Yes. I highlighted it, which I think is like, (laughs) which yeah, it is long and maybe we should read it at some point. But, um, that was not exactly, but sort of, a, like a Wittgensteinian point, right? That this is all 
we, we, we can't escape language, right? Like we can't get outside of language. We, there's no such thing as um, like an experience that isn't linguistically mediated. And I think that part of, you know, ironically and, and f- comically, as Paul was saying earlier, the, the hatred of the father figure for Wittgenstein is that he's he's just bitter that he that 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 he was correct about that that Wittgenstein was right that like at the end of the day we're we're stuck in language did, and there's nothing else to do with it. Do you think Wittgenstein did for language what Gödel did for like uh, logical notation or a sort of like pure mathematical symbolic language in terms of like rendering it suspect in its ability to ever touch upon anything that could be even regarded as real? <laughs> I, I, I think that's possible. I mean, I, I don't know a lot about Gödel, and I don't know a lot about philosophy of mathematics or anything like that, but the thing that I do associate Gödel with is his incompleteness theorem, right. which is that math is is forever incomplete. I don't fucking know what that means. Math podcasts, come on, uh, make us look dumb. But I, But in some ways, I think that the point is the opposite of at least my understanding of that superficial reading of Gödel, which is that language, um, the question of completeness maybe doesn't even enter into it, but there, but there is no outside, right? Like we're, we are encaged in this box of language and it can never fully, uh, capture either our experiences or the things that we think we want to say, but it is what we have and there's no getting out of it. Um, which in some ways is a Derridian kind of like postmodern in, in terms of, you know, literary mm. philosophy point, <laughs> which is separate. Derrida gets no shout out, shout outs in this book. Um, but I think he may, he may have, um, because I think some of this shit resonates. Do you think that that's like what, whatever it was trying to do with a lot of the, the flipping and the confusion and, and in particular like the passage we were talking about before the podcast gave like the the who's on first type one towards the end where it's just like <laughs> um it's like flipping back and forth but you don't even know who's really talking and then there's yeah. the person who like, the person what? whose name is name and then the person whose name is your name yes yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it seems like he's almost trying to I don't know if he's trying to deconstruct the notion that you can't get out of uh, the constructs of language or if he's just trying to explore that and like push it to the limits of that idea. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's up for interpretation. I mean, I think that uh, again, right? Like in that passage, which is it, which occurs in the, the, the third section of the book, which is maybe the weirdest one because there's, uh, photographs there's photographs and that section there's that whole description of of a maybe actual but also maybe imagined scene of a boy and his father accidentally driving into a kkk rally and then um fleeing and then the boy getting lost in the woods after his father is captured and lynched um and then he's kind of discovered uh, I read it narratively that way, right? Where like these these characters who are named name and like your name and whatever are they discover him in the woods after him fleeing that 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 scene. Uh, but but again, all this question of naming, right? Like what 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 sort of uh, and obviously he references like speech act theory and and uh, all that stuff in the text as well. But, you know, what does it mean to give something a name, right? And what is it that we are doing or what is it that is referred to by the name that we give to anything? Like when I say Paul, what am I referring to, right? Am I referring to a a, a physical object, a body? Am I referring to a sort of aggregation of like my own memories and experiences with something that I call Paul And, and, and so on and so forth? But yeah, I do think that section is really uh, relevant to bring up. And I do also want to reference, uh, as, I've, as we've all said, we haven't read any other Everett books, but he, I know he has another book called I Am Not Sidney Poitier, which is a, obviously a reference to Sidney Poitier. Yeah. But, yeah. but uh, <laughs> look the, who's coming to dinner. Or yeah, yeah. Right, exactly. But, but the main character of that book is named not Sidney Poitier. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> which are they like that that's his name in the text and so like this is something that everett has been concerned with clearly i think for a while I was thinking of in New York City. There's a there were so many Ray's pizzas, right? They just kept saying that the the name Ray, like Ray's Pizzeria, that there was a pizzeria I went to that was Ray, not Ray's Pizzeria Two. Two. <laughs> 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 That's great. That is genius. Yeah. So it's a similar uh, conundrum there. <laughs> I was also thinking because of the, just the naming convention. I mean, you got obviously like Adam in the garden and whatever, yeah. naming all the shit. Uh, but, uh, and I don't know, I can't pursue this line of thinking, but there was in Confucianism, there's something called the rectification of names, which is, uh, uh, I guess, a reframing of a similar idea that um, when there's when there's a lack of harmony in the world, uh you know, and, and and within the logos or whatever, and within language, it's it's a uh, it's an issue with that needs to be rectified through a, a reestablishment of of the proper names of things, so that they actually correspond to reality, so that we can regain harmony. Uh, I don't know much more about it than that, but I just it thought that like was a concept he would know and probably was referencing. I think. Well, yeah, I was going to say that reminds me. Of, I forget what book it was. But something we really dealt with, like, the issues of translations and how you basically, we, uh, at the end of it, you can't really trust a translation at all. Mm -hmm. um, I almost think he was trying to bring up that point, too, because even in that in this passage... Another, another Deridian point. There's, like, uh, multiple uses of just, like, different languages. Like, there's a sec that, that part where the guy, one of the two people talking... Just keeps answering in a different language, and they're like, "Is that Russian?" Yes. He answers in German. He's like, <laughs> "What was that?" And then he answers in Spanish. Like, yeah. Spanish. <laughs> and then Italian. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, on on that point, Paul, uh, uh, again, before we started recording, you you kind of mentioned to me something that had not occurred to me at all as I was reading this book, but you brought up the Last Samurai. Yeah. And I kind of wanted you to expand on that a little bit. Well. Yeah, I wanted to bring up that point to Matt too because that was Matt's pick, and um, but yeah, it dealt with like kind of similar relationships. It was like a, it was a mother and a son in that book, who were both like pretty smart. Like the kid was like a super genius, and she was just like a well-educated woman. And it also had uh, a lot of like different jips and jabs with. <laughs> with like fonts and languages and sizes of things and just kind of, it kind of just became like kind of experimental and erratic in the way that this book did too. Um, so there's like some parallels there. I, I mean, not huge ones, but like maybe just there's like also a reference reading. to Russell, isn't there? Russell's, yeah. uh, Russell's own edu like education as a kid. Because Russell was, uh, I don't know if he studied math originally, but Russell was also definitely interested in mathematics. So yeah, I kind of yeah. feel like this book uh, wasn't it, like necessarily tr like doing what that book did, but this de this book definitely has more layers. I would say <laughs> I wasn't yeah. in love with that book, and it's also a lot more enjoyable to read and funny. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I think Helen Dewitt, uh, upon further sort of investigation in time. Yeah, I don't know. I, I I think she is kind of um, not like Everett in her well, viewpoint remember, on things. And I actually were... don't. I don't. I don't know if I actually. Whatever. I, this I... this is where I'd put in the Metal Gear Solid sound effect for if we had the soundboard. But <laughs> I'm suspicious of her. Well, you said you listened to some interviews with her, right? And you got a vibe, which I did too. I thought I liked her. Now I'm I'm, I'm kind of on the negative side of things. Yeah. Uh, where I, 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 like I said, I think she's, she's actually more of a. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you what I find interesting. Feelings? No, I don't give a fuck about Helen Dewitt. I've never met the woman, but like, <laughs> uh, I was reading some of the short stories and, and, and I find her to be, uh, potentially a snob in the bad sense because i like snobbery and elitism i do but like 
I, I, when it comes at the, uh, again, at this anti kind of Percival Everett stance of, I know I am sort of m- somewhat confident in what the correct thing to do is here. Mm-hmm. And whatever, I don't mind if you have principles or take a stand and there are right and wrong things to do, but like, I, I, I sympathize more with Everett here and, and, and I think, uh, in some circles, he would be regarded as as another one of these like sort of like postmodern nihilists, who is like trying to like sort of like liquefy and turn all meaning into this sort of indifferentiable jelly mm-hmm. that we no one will be able to know. Like, oh, like n- it doesn't matter. Nothing matters. Everything's the same. You know, which I don't think yeah. he's doing either. I don't know if if you feel like he's uh sort of nihilistic or, or he's cynical for sure but i don't know if you think he's nihilistic paul no i don't think he's nihilistic i mean i i walked away from this book especially like the last five sentences i think they were sad you know there's a heart to this book that um kind of it made me feel warm you know it, even though it was kind of nihilistic and sad i don't think i don't know i walked away thinking that it wasn't like necessarily his his worldview to be like purely doomer I did want to talk though about when you when you were just like a minute ago saying talking about snobbery and Helen DeWitt's snobbery, because mm-hmm. I I obviously like am attracted to that too you know to a certain extent. Um, I think maybe we all are, <laughs> but uh, what makes it I think what makes it bad for me get that coffee. If someone is like, <laughs> it, it has to do with someone's motives. Like I I, I find Everett to be just just a highly intelligent person who's been interested in different topics naturally through his whole life. And it's just like comes out of him artistically, but when, and that can, that can lead you into a snobby direction of any kind, if you're that type of person. But what, what I don't like about the other side of the spectrum is like, if someone just thinks that that is cool to do and they're not actually motivated by like trying to figure things out for themselves or like, you know what I mean? Or gain intelligence or gain knowledge. They just like want to be in that club. Then I have a problem with it. It just comes off as like off putting when someone's like that. Yeah. I think, I think what I'm thinking about, and and, and this is addressed directly in the book and I don't know how to approach this topic. It's like, but I mentioned it before. It's like, there's a, uh, there's a, there's a question addressed to the, you know, ostensible author about whether or not they are postmodern. Mm-hmm. And the author, whoever it may be, truthfully or not, because, you know, that's part of the whole thing, was like, I'm actually uh, not averse to the term modernist for my own orientation towards writing if I were to write or am writing indeed. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yes. And I... And I think what's so what's so funny about that is like there is this uh there is this debate happening and uh I don't know I, I would love to talk about it further right like th- there is a debate around modernism and postmodernism and and the efficacy of of the term postmodern and what it is that the postmodern project is that the modernist project isn't um and uh, one of the things that I'd notice about people who are defending modernism uh, these days, contemporary defenders of modernism, a lot of them is like, uh, is a sort of retreat, I would say, intellectually, um, uh, to forms that are like familiar and whatever, and uh, and a desire to see what I, I actually see in this book, which is like a familiarity with, the hard sciences, with math, um, with all those fucking STEM shit that they claim the humanities lacks, and that philosophy. This book is more about philosophy than any of those things. <laughs> no, I'm just saying, like it 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 addresses at all uh, the things that like the you know uh, the kind of continental degenerate postmodern philosophers don't and would never think about uh, addressing. And uh, there's a, there was a little, what was it? Uh, as far as like the the sort of like materialist kind of uh, scientifically minded, you know, eventually we'll find out why it is that it's true that the scientific method is kind of like the best me- the best method for always 
sort of arriving at truth. It's just, uh, there was this little thing, it just says, every fool believes that if the coin has come up heads ten times in a row, it will more likely be tails the next time. And I just, that to me is kind of a... The gambler's rough, fallacy. Just sort of a rough and dirty, like, little fun jab at, at, at that kind of, like, scientific mindset, right? Like, I get it, it can be taken uh, in a sort of absurd direction of whatever, like, doubt where whatever you can you, yeah you can jump off a bridge and be like maybe i'll float up into the air but like uh you know what i mean like the point uh, the point for me is <laughs> right. taken like right like these things aren't sure yeah i mean i i i think the question of modernism and postmodernism in this book is like really foregrounded and something that needs to be talked about because there's uh i i highlighted two sections specifically where every slash the narrator slash who the fuck ever um, mm-hmm. specifically addresses this question of postmodernism. And, and, and one is on uh, page 79 uh, in my edition. And this is, I think, the first explicit mention of this. What was the thing in your career that irked you the most? Funny you should have... Uh, funny... You should have me have you ask me that question. I'm sorry. It's like, already. I know. I'm like lost already. Uh, strange. Son, it was being called a postmodernist. I don't even know what the fuck that is. Some asshole tried to explain it to me once, said that my work was about itself and process and not about objective <laughs> reality and life in the world. What did you say to him? After I told him to fuck himself and the horse he rode in on, I asked him what he thought objective reality was. Then I punched him. That's why I had to leave my job at Iowa. <laughs> and I just think, like, like, right, like, this is the sort of classic, it's an articulation of the sort of classic critique of postmodernism, right? Which is like, oh, you're not in touch with objective reality. You're not, right. it, it, it doesn't matter to the day-to-day lives of people. It's sort of like, um, if you want to go the political direction, it's politically uh, uh, inert. It's not actually, like, making any difference or change or anything or whatever. And I think that's sort of like, I just punched him in the face and I had to quit my job. It's like, it's just such a funny exchange about the idea. Mm -hmm. And then it it resurfaces again later. And this, I think, may speak more directly to the point you were just making, Matt. This is on um, page 150 for me, uh, section 29 of of the second section. And so you've come to visit and you've written your visit into actuality, or I have written this for you once again, though none of it matters a hill of whatever now, does it? You asked me once if I was postmodern, and I asked you if your question contained a hyphen. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, that, that, that's already just great, right? Like, because this is the other thing, right? Like, postmo- is postmodern as one word a distinct thing or does it just mean after modern right does it just mean whatever historically arises or comes after the modern era right that's an interesting question and that's kind of what he's getting there at, at there with the, the sort of question about the hyphen um i finally have an answer and i offer it here as it is a propos of my following dear virgil down satan's shivering hairy back I have finally figured out I do not wish to deny being a modernist by trying to embrace all that is familiar while pretending to not be concerned with making something brand spanking new. I do not wish to create new cliches, but neither will I bear my soul to build the new machine that no one has seen just to have it do what the old machine did. So what am I about, son? Dying, son. Dying well, dying powerfully, vigorously, with might and main to chop and change to suit my dying mission to tie dying ever to life, to living, to breathing, to tie dying to the moon and the stars, to fix dying to light and darkness and rain and mist and arid winds. And and I think that's just an interesting kind of like a way to address the question, right? Because it, it, it also speaks to some of the kind of originary questions of philosophy, right? Like Plato famously said the, the you know the like the question of philosophy is how to all philosophy is preparation for death right that's what i was trying a, to a, say according yeah. to philo- uh, plato and and this is sort of a a long meditation going through frega and wittgenstein and kripke and all these people and an actual death and an actual death right exactly to sort of circle around that that fucking drain yeah, good way of putting it. 
it's just like um i don't know there's something ab- about the the c- hmm. do you think there's some merit it just feels like it's it's of a different order like uh the people who are like postmodernism is a kind of dead end right it's an it's an infinite regress it is a circle around a drain it is a black hole right it's it, th- there's nowhere to go like however um like upon describing like what what was the, what was the modernist uh, uh sort of motivation it was it was it was uh, a rupture and and an attempt to like save the old forms while at the same time somehow making them breathing life into them by uh, addressing the contemporary the new concerns about like you know the fragility of meaning and right like all this kind of post war stuff and it's like I don't know. I, I I just don't know how you would not uh, see. Uh, 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 hmm. I'm kind of at sea a little bit. Like like. The, the, this fucking book will put you there. I'll just say that. Like uh, uh, as a reader, even as someone with a relatively robust background in a lot of the shit that Everett's referencing. Well, it's it's. I think it's an important distinction, and like he's clearly also grappling with. I think that distinction in the book, and it's like the, the those charges leveled at postmodernism in some ways make a lot of sense to me, and I think have like shown themselves to be kind of true. It's like a it, it's a cheap and and some and somewhat easy way to just sort of to go into the drain and not really say anything. But at the same time, there's some incredibly, like, vital things being said. And, and it's, it, and it's, a, it, 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 it's like a weird um, performative contradiction in a way, right? Because, like, this fucking book is, in, in a lot of ways, like, the apotheosis of, of yes. what we would normally think of as postmodern literature. Like, it, it, this is the most, like, self-referential kind of like internally like making its own kind of like internal world book that i've ever fucking read this is so this is the most pomo yeah you could read yeah Yeah. no i mean it really is and it's um but like you say matt like you wonder how much of even the writing of the book is a send-up of the style itself right because a lot of the philosophy he's engaging with, that's fucking just mainline analytic philosophy shit. People who would have nothing to do with postmodernism as we understand it when we're doing literary analysis or whatever. Kripke, Wittgenstein, Frege, they were doing like hardline fucking logic, uh, philosophy of language shit. And the way the book is written addressing those thinkers it it it's it, it's a mind fuck like it really is like there's an incongruity there and well, i don't know i don't know what to make of it i i find i'm unconvinced that there's not the the, the reason i was drawn you know early on as a young person to probably what i i guess like postmodernists you know uh was that i don't think i don't Something something vital is still being communicated, and in this book too, I felt that like it's not true that like there aren't these eternal human verities still being at some in some way communicated. You know, like like the relationship between father and son in this book. Right. It's like I understand how like Deleuze is like weaponized by the CIA to like melt all meaning so that no one else can agree on something, but I also don't think that it's something that should be. Uh, Therefore, then vilified, and it's just a baby with the bathwater kind of situation for me. Which isn't isn't there a, a moment or a reference to baby in bathwater at yes. the end of the book? Yeah, right. God damn, the book really like really just hits on everything. <laughs> it's 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 already ahead of you. The same way language is ahead of all of us. <laughs> yeah, this. I mean, my uh, cards on the table now too. This was a great book. I. It, <laughs> I don't even know what segments that I've highlighted to read because there's also a sort of modular quality to it because everything means the same thing. You know what I mean? Wait, I wanted yes. To, uh, <laughs> yes. I wanted to read a passage because it was just making me think of what you guys were just talking about. It's on 218 at the bottom to 219. 
uh, way towards the end, huh? Yeah, yeah. But I think it, I think it relates to what you were just saying, Matt, a little bit. Um, I'm you highlighted it. I nice. have it starred. Yep. Gray minds. I'm sad about my I'm sad about my father. You miss him, yes. But imagine you didn't. What do you mean? Imagine what it would mean if you didn't feel so bad. If he were dead and you didn't feel a thing or you felt good, that's not possible. It's not possible only because it isn't, but it, it, but it is very possible because it could be, and since it could be, try to imagine what it, would, what it would mean. When children die, they come back as themselves, as adults. Fucking weird. And, and you know what Percival Everett does? It's a like, great, great section. One of the things that he flattens the meaning, uh, you know, the sort of significance of all things is uh, to an effect that I think is is more reflective of real, like lived experience, and uh, even if it's just sort of like for the moment, is he avails himself to everything, right? Like classic storytelling, just a regular ass story about some guy on a ranch, or like you know he he does he the first part is like just these class and 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 he's aware of it obviously and he's commenting on the fact that he's like and if if I were to be a hack this is what I do here etc he says that a lot whatever well, and, but and, then- and Everett's written like one of his other novels is like as far as i understand it like basically a straightforward western that are awesome. To, that's awesome like he writes like stuff like that but but my, my point being just that like um that does the job of somehow communicating and like uh, expressing as much as the the the, the work that is um, cynically aware of the genre conventions at play and commenting on those while at the same time telling the story or or, or eschewing that and just doing nursery rhymes or sort of uh, holding court on you know a, a, a fucking a fucking math or something you know right like. The, the equalizing happens, and I don't think it is a, um, I don't think it is a leveling of meaning, or, hmm, it's not a, it's, it's, it's not belittling anything, I guess, maybe. Like, I get, I get how the equalizing thing, uh, ruffles some feathers amongst people who, um, are like more inclined to a kind of hierarchy of, of importance and, and whatever, but like, you know, Everett's doing all of it here to show his thesis of of that, like, all this stuff can still in some way be addressing the same stuff. Yes, and I think, um, I'm just going to read another section because I think it addresses that point, Matt, because, so I've been reading, uh, albeit very slowly, Jameson, Frederick Jameson's book on postmodernism, and, 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 and Jameson is, is a critic of postmodernism. Um, right. He actually thinks postmodernism is, uh, you know, he's a Marxist, relatively orthodox, uh, and and it deserves criticism. I mean, it's not, you know, I'm not. I'm, yeah, I'm not. I'm not fucking signing off on any program here by any means. But uh, I, 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 I think that this passage spoke to me in terms of the context of my reading of Jameson, um, and in terms of the way that postmodernism as a movement and as a historical era relates to its own history, which in Jameson's reading is essentially erasing it, right? Like it's a, it's an ahistorical movement that is kind of, um, you know, only concerned with sort of situating itself in the kind of ever occurring present. Uh, and so this occurs relatively soon after the, that passage that I read earlier about the, him punching the guy who asked him if he was a postmodernist. Um, and uh, he, he's talking about his, this is, I, I think, the father talking and uh, the son, the father's wife, he's obsessed with his his wife having an affair with like an airman, which may or may not have happened. Uh, because the yeah. son, the son keeps saying uh, she never actually left dad. Like, what are you talking about? And he's like, oh, that's what you think. But like, the, the, that's he's going through I'm... some eyes wide su- shut kind of uh, <laughs> right, crisis. Exactly. Yeah. So, so it says your mother went to Canada and married the fly boy. And the thing about your mother was that once gone, she could not look back. If I may segue 
in so non sequitur a manner. Not that she would have become a pillar of salt or anything so horrible or fanciful or wonderful, but because in looking back, she would be admitting that she was gone, that she had left something behind. And with that glance, with that admission, she would have, she would be doomed to recognize her memories as constructions of a left world, necessarily fictions, necessary fictions, because in looking back, she would see a reality to which her memories might be compared and contrasted. And she would know that her memories were not uh, that world. And so all would be fucked and the world behind and the world awaiting. So you see, it never pays to look back, maybe not even to the side. It's almost like going through that whole mirror stage thing all over again, except this time you have to actually acknowledge the initial lack that must be present for the glance backward to be possible at all. And even if you don't look back, the wall between subject and object, you and it, is already obliterated. But if you do, if you actually do look back, then God help you, and I suppose, and as well as anyone you look back at, if you will allow this clause to save this sentence from ending with a preposition... I might have blamed your sweet saint of a cheating mother for a very short time for leaving, but I never blamed her for not looking back. And I, and I think, like, in a, in a way that that's a, a sort of statement of, I don't know if it's a critique or whatever, but it seems to me to be an, an articulation of the postmodern position. Like, not looking back. Mm-hmm. Like, the, that history is, is, is sort of erasable and, and, and mutable in a way that we never really thought that it was. Um, it, it, here, of course, it's articulated in in the, the relationship between a, a, a man and his cheating wife, which I, I thought was just fucking hilarious and, and incredible. Yeah, and, and there's a little Lacan there, right? Yes, there's a, a bunch of Lacan in there. Okay, never mind. All yeah. about the, the subject and the object and uh, the lack and the initial lack and the, the sort of lack being the motivating force. Yeah. But within that, you know, obviously an admission that to not look back uh, is to avoid the fear of of looking at a past that is mutable, right? Which is kind of probably what the bad postmodern shit does. Right. You know, and I, I, I'm sympathetic to the idea of, of postmodernism obviously just bo- sort of being like a, a, a complication of the concerns of modernism. I don't know why I'm obsessed with this. It's because I've recently been having to think about it. But I mean, well, it's it's hard not to be reading this book. It's one of the kind of animating, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, forces, I think, in the text. Well, I don't have, you know, your fancy philosophers to reference, but as the great Norm MacDonald said about his book, uh, I left out a lot of facts in, in, in the favor of truth, you know? And that's that's I think yes. that's also yes. <laughs> kind of one of the, the the functions that's happening, or like you know one of the the ethos somewhat of the book. I was just talking to someone about Norm Macdonald at the bar tonight before I came here. So I was drunk before we started recording. Um, nice. No, I'm right kidding. <laughs> but we were talking about Norm Macdonald, and I was like, uh, you know, I, I forget the point that they were making, but it, it, I think you're right to bring up Norm Macdonald here. Oh yeah. Yes. <laughs> Can you elaborate at all? No. <laughs> all right. Who, by the way, my uh, instinct is would not be a fan of postmodernism. Just for the record. I'm not going to go he, on record with that. But he did say about his book that he left out a lot of he left out the facts in favor of the truth. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the things that's going on here. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, what are the facts here? I mean, like, right. right? Like what, what are even the facts to be left out? Right. We, we don't even have a sense of it. We, we, we lose track, like essentially within the first two pages of even who the narrator is. <laughs> and after that, it becomes completely muddled. Yeah, and, it, and I think it ratchets up the complexity, right? You know, initially you have, like, you're like, okay, I kind of get it. It's like a dad and his son, and the dad is, like, in a nursing home, and they're discuss- they're, they're discussing each other's perspectives on each other, 
It's like, okay, I can kind of like hold hold on to that. And he's like just doing the kind of classic unreliable narrator stuff. He's um, even within the same page, um, forgetting details. The names like, of I, characters change. Yeah, I think like uh, at some point he's discussing like like his memory of like what he was doing and he's like eating a different kind of sandwich. Yes. <laughs> Uh, over the course of a couple pages and like, and it, and it, I get maybe, do you think it does kind of ratchet up in a kind of linear way or maybe, es- uh, sort of exponential way? Yeah. Like where it's like, yeah, I was thinking, yeah, it's kind of like that graph, the exponential graph where he's kind of like steadily going up at first and then phew, just like off, off the freaking rails. Pretty quickly. What's the math term? It's like, it's, it's asymptotic, asymptotic. right? Yeah. It's yeah. like asymptotically appro- approaching the, uh, line. Yeah. The edge, the edge of, uh, language's capabilities to, to, to do what it is, is, uh, sort of purportedly for, I guess. Right. <laughs> yeah. I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about race in this book. Because, sure. like you mentioned earlier, Matt, like a uh, Nat Turner is a recurring character. Martin Luther King and Martin Luther King and um, Charlton Heston, weirdly. Yeah. And uh-huh. um, uh, what's the guy's name? Uh, Will Stryan, who wrote, who was a white author who wrote like a biography or like yeah, who, who Bill... wrote a book as Nat Turner. <laughs> yeah. Bill Which Sty- Bill Styron? What I, was his name? I think it's it, it's Styron or Stryon. I think I have it. I opened up a bunch of tabs on this. Styron. Okay. William Styron. He Is wrote a book. book? He wrote a book. Now? I, I mean, I I don't know. He wrote a book called <laughs> The Confessions of Nat Turner in 1967, and he's just a white guy. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and it's like written apparently as sort of like a from the perspective of Nat Turner, who famous, you know, of course, for those of you who don't know, led a slave revolt and yeah, uh, was a famous uh, figure in African American history in this country, and uh, and Nat Turner and William Stryon Styron, God, uh, are are these kind of like constantly recurring figureheads that the narrator like assumes in his stories within the story within the story <laughs> and he's like uh, uh, I, I, I don't know I, I, I think that like race plays a huge role in this text um, and I think it's interesting to think about the ways in which that kind of like is, is approached because there's all these of course like sort of academic references to like Bill Styron who you have to look up like who the fuck knows who that is except for probably you know like people who are concerned with that sort of literature um but then also there are these very visceral and violent scenes of um people being lynched and there's a scene of a child seeing his father being lynched and having his genitals cut off and and then there's another sort of scene where the narrator father is writing as someone who was putting, uh, helping write the Martin Luther King I Have a Dream speech, but all of the stuff he wanted to put in was cut out, <laughs> which I thought was hilarious. Yes, and he was pissed off. Yeah, yeah. And he was pissed. I, I, that, that literally was, I thought, I thought that was one of the funniest um, <laughs> sections of the book. Let me see if I can, I, I, I know for sure that I... Uh, yeah, I, 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 I have it flagged. Do so, uh, in the year of your Lord, 1963, August 27, I was in a hotel room with John Lewis and three over three other members of SNCC, and I was livid. I had provided several, several lines to John's speech, and they were being removed. I remember the lines. The first was, if the dogs of the South continue unchained, then we will bite back, and we will move on those tender parts that bleed so readily, that bleed so profusely. Okay, I said, understanding that there was a lot of blood in that statement, rather threat. And so I added the word nonviolently. <laughs> <laughs> this was not satisfactory. <laughs> the next line was, the Kennedy administration does not even talk a good game, failing to support voters' rights while paying mere lip service to civil rights as if there is a difference. We say fuck the administration that still walks hand in hand with Jim Crow. Well, I could see that the word fuck was a bit strong, and so I suggested screw. And then screw nonviolently. 
I was never much of a player in the politics of the day after that evening. <laughs> like, 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 that's just a fucking, like, joke. That's just, like, a funny stand-up joke that you could tell. You know what I mean? But it's also, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. I guess I want to throw it to y'all in terms of, like, what was your read on the way that race played in this book? Because it seems like a big factor. I think my initial just feeling about it was that like I mean by the end of it I did kind of feel like it was just the like the stories of of an old man in a coma and like weird memories going through his head of like different events that may or may not have even happened but you know certain events that probably did happen but him just like having these floods of inevitable memories for like his dad who was you know old african-american man who probably experienced racism so i I, th- I think i just read it as being like a autobiographical storytelling really i think he saw it also as part and parcel with uh the problem of name naming and designation uh like i i saw some clip where Percival Everett, the author, the real guy, was like, sort of like, you know, uh, t- you know, I'm just, I'm skeptical of, of racial categories and like, um, I don't, I, I, I fucking hate post racial because it's a, a, a sort of uh, acknowledgement that race has anything to do with anything. You know, just kind of like, he definitely is, I don't know, almost like the, I know we were kind of clowning on Gene Toomer for this, but you know what I mean? Like, uh, I don't know, kind of ha- uh, expressing a more contemporary version of, of those views in a way. Uh, but at the same time, like, yeah, th- he's not shying away from the reality at all. He's using racial epithets and discussing racial violence and talking about fucking Martin Luther King. You know, there, there's no, there's like, right. there's no stronger reference to make in, in, the, in the face of, uh, you know, and Nat Turner, like he's referencing <laughs> early American black slavery and the civil rights movement, re Martin Luther King. Uh, and yeah, just the fact that you need to uh, live with your potentially, your, 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 your potentially false categorization that regardless has an effect on reality. And I, I, that still fi- feels like it fits with the themes that are going on. Yeah. I and, mean, and, you know, I, w- when I was getting my master's degree, uh, there was a guy in my department. Um, I forget his name off the top of my head. Um, he was, he was of Asian background, uh, but he's, his whole work was on the linguistic, like philosophy of language, but specifically about like racial epithets. Like that's what he wrote about. And, and published about. And I think that Everett is also very concerned about that sort of thing, right? Like, what does it mean to name somebody as a race or to categorize somebody as a race? And obviously the, the N word occurs uh, many times in this, in this text. Um, yeah. And at one point he does a variation on the sort of like, um, I, I know he's canceled, but this sort of like Louis CK joke where like, saying the phrase the n-word is just the same thing as <laughs> saying as, as, as saying the actual n-word he's actually canceled for uh joke stealing yeah right yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> um but i do think it's interesting like 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 the way that racial kind of classifications happen from a sort of a third n- not a third party but from another party on to another person that they're placed there uh, that seems to be something that Everett is concerned with. Racial zo- dolazol. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God! Yes. What? Well, yes. Think, um, I don't know how much this bleeds into that, but like, the other thing that I thought was funny about the Martin Luther King section is—is is this historically true? Was he given uh, some sort of ver- like verbatim? T- like paper speech to read via you know fucking Herbert Hoover or whatever, or, uh, and he did. I have a dream on off the cuff, or was that written? Was or was I just 
misled by this book? Uh, I, I actually don't know. Obviously, I know that the the FBI was intimately concerned with what King was doing, and they were observing him and so on and so forth. But I don't know specifically because the the way that it, like Matt was saying, the way that it's told in this book is that King was given essentially his notes for the speech, but he was given the wrong things, and it was like some crazy like cia like fbi written like i'm a terrorist i want to kill america blah 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 like bullshit right. and he ripped it up and and did the i have a dream speech kind of off the dome um i don't know if that's i don't know if that's true uh specifically because yeah i guess in the service of of this book uh I don't know how long it. I'm wondering how long it took to write this book. Uh, and again, I'm I'm always kind of constantly thinking about you know the the catalyst being the death of of your progenitor, you know your father, your mother. Um, but you know, in terms just significantly in terms of like some historical figure getting a text and then instead expressing what they actually felt. Um, uh, seems significant to me. It's, it, 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 it seems like that is not a true story, the way that it's told in this book. All right. Well, still, it still works, right? Because it's, <laughs> yeah. fic- it's a fiction. Oh, that yeah, completely. the shit that we're reading. Yes. <laughs> well, his I dad have died a... in 2010, right? And then he wrote it, and it was published in 2013. Yeah, so maybe like a yeah, two-year span two or years. so. Yep. Uh, I don't know if this even uh, is r- relevant to what we're saying at the moment, but I just found a little chunk that I highlighted. It just says, uh, let me clue you into something. It's all failure. We're all failures as sons, as fathers, as mothers, siblings. It is a necessary truth. Uh, there are no rules, and yet we feel bound to them. There are no duties that need to be carried out. There are only expectations, unarticulated and arbitrary and formless and ever-changing expectations, expectations that exist as fistfuls of gelat- gelatinous blobs that we try over and over to nail to the walls of our houses. And what they do is drip and collect and pool and ferment and turn into guilt and some other things. Oh, Jeremiah 324. Take the bail and run with it, boy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. But of course, right, like, again, this is another reference to sort of Christian mythology and, and, and Dante and everything. Take the ball, right? Ball right. being a, a demon, sort of another name for, uh, I believe, another name for Satan, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, I think so. Oh, you know what else was referenced? And I, I kind of forgot how this went. Uh, occurrence An occurrence at Owl Creek Bridge. Is it? That came a up a couple times, yeah. That's a guy who, like what, like, has a whole alternate reality flash before his eyes before he's killed by hanging? Is that right? That that sounds right. It's been a long time since I've read you know, it, if Paul? I'm honest. No, I didn't read that. I didn't even read it. I, I feel it's, like, it was, like, almost, like, read to me. Like, it was, like, a school thing. I was um, a bad student. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't listening, but just a a, a fiction rapidly occurring bef- right before someone's death. Uh, it is referenced a couple times, including during yeah. that like sort of like post lynching scene where the him as a little boy is running through the woods, like it's sort of really quick. Like maybe he ran over the bridge that was kind of supposed to be the Owl Creek Bridge. Well, and then there's a picture of it as well later in the book. The potentially. Like the well, the the bridge that he used to, uh, uh like, because the bridge is broken, right? Yeah. When he tries to run across it, and then there's a picture, in the latter uh section of the book that's sort of collapsed over a ravine, and it's sort of uh this is on two fourteen, but it's sort of assumed that he sort of uses it to 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 climb up and and get across the river. Gotcha. Okay. Who baby. Yeah. 
But I mean, I mean, I think Matt, like again, in terms of like the 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 references in the book, like there are references to um, Thomas Carlyle and Sartre Rosartus, right? Like in the yeah. uh, in, in in the section which we haven't talked about, and we probably should, which does the the one flew over the cuckoo's nest kind of narrative, which is a big chunk of the book. Um, and, and arguably the one that I did not know how to grapple with the most, um, there's, uh, uh, the, uh, place, it, 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 yeah, I know. It's Uh, Truffle's Droke. Truffle's Droke or whatever. Uh, Uh, Estates or like, yeah, uh, something like that. Which is, of course, the, the, uh philosopher that Sartre Rosartus is supposed to be kind of about like parsing his which is of course a, a sort of send up of a Hegelian uh, German idealist philosophy um, yeah the philosopher is Diogenes Tufel's Druk right which and, means god born <laughs> devil shit right in literal <laughs> terms <laughs> right and so that's the name of the building or that's the name of the facility that they're all kind of um trapped in in that section of the book what what did you guys make of that second section we haven't talked about it a lot because the, uh, that's the one that's sort of like the most kind of like sustained narrative i guess where there's all of these various characters that are in this old folks home kind of engaged in this battle of like pranks almost but it's also very serious with these evil orderlies well i know like just for tufel's joke as like uh the sarder Sardis thing it's like even that right like the tailor retailored and 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 the, the plot of that book being about a a, a fictional biographer and a kind of almost corrections or a a, a Right or the correction style, what what am I thinking of? Well, it it, it is right. It's Bernhardian, right? Like there's like a. It is sort of a fictional kind of biography told kind of like third hand. Like it's someone. It it's it's a fictional commentary on a philosopher that never existed. (laughs) Right, and and part of the. Part of the commentary on that philosopher's work which is about clothing was like a person re uh, assembling scraps of paper to try and create a sort of sensible narrative out of it. So it's also just like the guys like, here's a bag of like shreds of paper and you need to like rebuild them and figure out what it is I'm saying even, you know? So that's just, that just starts it out. Like that's just a sort of, an idea that you're supposed to already kind of like have in your head before the nursing home shit. That, that reminds me of like Vonnegut a little bit. Oh yeah, which uh, which books? Wait, am I thinking of the right thing? Isn't it a Vonnegut book where someone has to like menially move something over and over again? I don't know. I actually, I've only read. Um, uh, I want to be thinking sh- of fuck. something totally different. I've only read like Ice, the one with Ice Nine in it, like Cat's Cradle, and then like uh, the one with Yosarian, the, the I guess Slaughter is it Slaughterhouse Five? Yeah, I even, where the I don't aliens what... get the fucking World War <laughs> One guys. Yeah. I, I I actually can't remember. I really I read those uh, super super young. Yeah, I think like most people did. I actually only thought about that because in the interview I was listening to with Everett, he mentioned really liking Vonnegut and like which surprised me because I, I I think of Vonnegut as kind of like a high school type author that you kind of read and like get into different forms of literature after him but he was saying that like his later books like the last three or four like he he kind of gripped onto something that was like beyond or you know a little more mm-hmm. elevated towards later in his life yeah it you know we we've read now we like we read the great gatsby that's like mm-hmm. you know that high upon school. recent consideration you, you read that in fucking high school you're what you know you're 16 years old it's like yeah. it's still a good book right and you're obviously bringing something new to the, your assessment of it as an adult man you know it's like yeah. 
I'd be interested to read a Vonnegut book on the podcast. I think Me it'd too. Be a good idea. Me too. Yeah. My mom. He spoke at my mom's college when she was no uh, going there in the early '80s, and it's like humble brag. <laughs> she said he was a drunk. She she said he was trashed. Really? <laughs> yeah. He was Maybe trashed. He, he was. He was mean. Oh damn. But like in a cranky way, not like a horrible way. But he was just right. like, yeah, you know, fucking, I'll say whatever. Like, don't you know what I mean? Like, give me water. Like, <laughs> give me water. So I, I don't Pedialyte. know. Yeah, I need Pedialyte. I'm fucking hungover. I don't know. I thought that the second the second se- section was. I don't know. It was great. It 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 was fun. One of the funniest. Like I keep going back to like. I mean, my reading experience. Definitely, I think, different than how you guys read it because I just, my basic, uh, I just knew I didn't understand and I wasn't going to make connections to a lot of it. So I was enjoying the rest of it, which is a big chunk of it, you know, just the right, the weird, like, surreal moments between characters and the hilarious writing and the, but like, also just really, really good writing. Um, but I wanted to read something funny uh, on one fifty three that made me laugh out loud. Uh, I don't remember what's leading up to it, but it'll be funny anyway. Um, Are you Frenhofer? I asked. Are you stupid? Yes, but that is besides the point. Is this a kiosk? That's kiosk. Of course it is. It's a pun. If you say so. I'd like to make copies of these keys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like. Well, so, so so right, so that's part of the subplot where the uh, they all conspire to steal the some keys from the orderlies, and then this is the moment when they're going to to try to get them copied, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, but again, right, like that's a linguistic pun. Like the 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 corporate name of the thing is the key ask. And it's a kiosk, and they go back and forth about it, and it's like yeah. fucking funny ass exchange. Oh, it's just also funny because the the one person just has no sense of humor, <laughs> which always makes an interaction more funny. Right. Yeah, I mean, I I I think like yeah, we've been talking a lot about uh, all the sort of like high minded uh, philosophy shit and 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 race shit, but like this book is fucking funny. And there, yeah. like, there are bits in here that are, like I've said, like literally just like straight up stand up jokes that I think would be hilarious if done in in a stand up special. Some of them I, that I would have a hard time uh, reading appropriately in the podcast because there's a lot of uh, N word jokes and stuff like that. Like, I mean, literally the first the first passage of the book is one of the funniest fucking things I've ever read. Yeah, Where, I got one. Yeah, go off. Well, were you about to talk about the health insurance one? No, not the health insurance. I was literally going to read like the 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 first section um, where <laughs> this is literally the, like the first two sentences of the book. Um, I'm just going to replace the N word in the text with uh, <laughs> I don't know what should I say like Negro? Is that okay? Mm-hmm. I mean, this, to me it is. <laughs> the, yeah. This is like the first uh, two sentences of the book. Let me tell you about my dream, my father said. Two black men walk into a bar, and the rosy-faced white barkeep says, we don't serve Negroes in here. And one of the men points to the other and says, but he's the president. And the barkeep says, that's his problem. (laughs) 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 That's that's one of the funniest fucking jokes I've read in a book ever. Yeah, it's it's the first thing written. I actually heard this first from uh, the the comedian, the late comedian Super Dave, Super Dave Osborne, uh, and I'm just reading this from memory, or not reading this from memory. I'm <laughs> fuck. Well, that makes sense based on what we're talking about. But uh, so like a, a new nurse in training is is walking through a hospital, right, with with a, a sort of head head PA, and. Uh, they are they're walking through and sh- and they're pointing out all of the you know different rooms and whatever and then in one of the rooms there's a guy furiously masturbating right and uh the one you know does. the new the nurse in training is like oh my god what like what the fuck like what's going on in there uh you're going to let that happen and the, the you know the PA is like look 
that person has like permanent arousal syndrome, like the, 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 they they need to masturbate every ten minutes, or or it's going to be a real problem. Like they, they it's a condition, right? Uh, and then they you know they take the ve- elevator up, and they're they're looking at some other floors and whatnot, and they 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 pass another room, and there's somebody. Uh, you know, getting getting a blowjob in one of the rooms. And the nurse in training is like, what the fuck is going on with this hospital? Like, you're just letting this kind of stuff happen. And the, and the, and the PA is like, no, 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 it's fine, it's fine. That that person has the same issue as the guy downstairs. She just has way better insurance. <laughs> 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 yeah, I love and, that. And I think in this book, it's it's related. Uh, and the two people, it's like, a, it's like a Senate aide and like a senator. Who have the yeah. conditions or something like that? Yeah, right. Yeah, I have another that's one. Kind of, I, I have like another a one. That just... like, yeah, go ahead. Comedy bit, really. You know, it, it works as as that. I think it's like an old ass joke. I, oh, really. I, I I have another one that that made me pee my pants. That I thought I just thought this shit was so funny because it's just so absurd. This is on thir- It's early thirty four, thirty five. Um. In fact, I knew yet another man still. Well, he was more of an acquaintance than a friend. I encountered him on my walk to campus. He was a nice enough looking fellow, but he had a large bl- blue cubes where his arms should have been. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yeah, I like this one, too. I, I stopped and stared, as you can well imagine. I looked at him and nodded to his blue cubes. He said, oh, these. Yes, I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you see... These. You see, I found this old pewter lamp. When I rubbed it, a genie appeared. He was large, muscular, and much taller than us. He told me it could have three wishes. Well, I wished first for a beautiful and comfortable home. You can see it behind me here. He gestured with a cube. <laughs> and, and, and indeed, behind him on a short hill was a beautiful Victorian house, large and clean, colorfully painted. I told him it was a nice house. He nodded. It is, he said. And then I wished for a beautiful wife. There she is on the back porch there. He gestured again with a blue cube. The woman on the porch was, in fact, quite striking, gorgeous, long, dark hair, dark eyes that I could appreciate even at such a distance. And then I asked, and then he said, something went horribly wrong when I wished for blue cubes' his arms. <laughs> <laughs> It's like, it's like apropos of nothing, but just like one of the funniest fucking yeah. like little vignettes that I've ever fucking read. <laughs> I wish yeah. for them for arms. <laughs> uh, so funny. Yeah, uh, the book is hilarious. It's it it, it it's dark. And and funny and like full of those kind of like disjointed moments where something like that pops in and and you don't really know how to feel about it. Like I mean, you, you, the whole second section of the book, the the when they're in the truffles, what truffles nursing home. Yeah. <laughs> I, I still don't know what to make of it because, I mean, there's a moment when uh, the presumably father narrator befriends another um, resident there who dies because his the picture of him and his daughter, like one of his most prized possessions, is knocked over by uh, the the evil orderlies. And then the, the narrator, father, whoever like takes his ashes and like speaks to him across the table at dinner and stuff. And it's like, it becomes like super poignant, but also it's embedded in this, like who is even telling the story, like, like sense as you're reading it, that the poignancy becomes like not diluted, but like it it hits in a different valence. If that makes sense. Do you think it's a detriment? I, I I don't you know because I, I it, it, it I feel like it it was something that just forced me to think about my own kind of phenomenological experience more than I maybe otherwise would have. It feels like the final story after the first three from the first half, like you know, like. The, 
I'm trying to find the, the sort of commonality between the first three stories about you know the 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 doctor who's taking care of the sort of morbidly obese drug dealer who pays him in camera equipment, the lonely ass rancher, and then and then of course the camera becomes the the Chekhov's gun in the story because there's a bunch of pictures in the last third, right? And there's as references well being, to the camera. Yes, as well as it being uh, actually owned by him as an old man in the nursing home yes. to get destroyed in a sort of retribution <laughs> in the, act. In the real story, like yeah, what was the th- uh, and then and then the artist's daughter, where it's like the whole point is that like um, you know, the, the, there's this DNA test that's never resolved about, uh, right, like lineage, I guess, whether or not this this girl is his daughter, right? Uh, so I guess uncertainty in all three. Uh, and then with the nursing home stuff, yeah, I don't know. It's, yeah, it's all that stuff is kind of abandoned. It's for this nursing home story, which is, yeah, this kind of like Nat Turner, one flew over the cuckoo's nest combo. And maybe they, uh, get into a car accident that induces the coma for the for him by the end. Well, uh, yeah, the sort of denouement of that section is that they all wind up escaping the nursing home uh, and stealing the keys to one of the vans and 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 driving to California, basically, right? And like driving to the to to the coast, and they're all sitting, and the, and the, like it's sort of like vaguely implied that maybe they stole a cocktail of medicine that would be kind of like suicide like death inducing yeah and they all kind of take it on the beach in california because like one of the running themes throughout that section of the book is is that like you know at this point and this gets back to the language thing right like at this point in our lives all of us here like we've said everything we have to say we've done everything we have to do and and there's the everything we do and say is just kind of like a reiteration of things we've said and done already. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and which is depressing, but it's also written in a very like human and almost liberating way. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why Matt, you asked earlier if I thought the book, if I walked away like with a nihilistic attitude, I think that's a good example of how he can write about something that is so like, you know, humanly tragic and sad, and but yeah, the way he wrote it, you walk away, walk away with a strange, warm feeling about what he's writing about. You know, yeah, that that's the thing is is this is definitely a book about death and the limits of human expression, and uh, I did not feel by the end of it that this was a particularly I would say postmodern even in the negative sense kind of kind of book. I, I I don't know. I yeah, I I felt kind of like cozy reading it. And I think like uh, that's that's kind of what pissed me off about reading the reviews that I read about this book is that they they were focusing on the kind of like inaccessible parts which <laughs> don't get me, don't get me wrong right like the, there are parts of this book that are inaccessible in kind of an academic way and it and, and it is written in a way that is inaccessible if you're kind of like a airport book reader um i i thought yeah. it was you know you, you know what i mean right yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. i thought it was i thought it was very readable sentence to sentence like i said like comparing it to like fucking the McElroy book last week. Mm-hmm. Um, you're never kind of lost in terms of uh, uh, the language. It, you you are lost, I think, in terms of the references and in terms of like the, the you know he randomly shifts to like rhyming poetry like within paragraphs like often throughout the text where it's like it just becomes like a like a, a 
you know, simple children's rhyme midway through a paragraph. You know what I mean? Yeah. And and that f- can 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 sort of feel inaccessible, but in terms of like the the themes and the sort of like human moments, like those shit, fu- those things like fucking hit for me big time. How, how do you, how do you feel about like the um the sequence underneath the like uh, I forget what it was called, like the summation, you know, notation equation where they have like the sigma symbol or whatever, and then it's like. To, to, to indicate all like potential sets of numbers infinitely or whatever, but like, and then all of the gerunds after that, and, like fighting, uh, you know, looting, fucking, uh, you know, just like for like two full pages or whatever. Right. I there's a there's an instance where I think like it's like point taken. But where you do kind of, I don't know, within the medium of a, of, a, of a story or however the fuck you want to say it, it's like, yeah, we could have non, we could have the pie of words where it's a infinite non-repeating string of letters, or, or you know, it, obviously language is a infinitely, you know, infinite sort of like combinatorial system, uh, and you can really push the limits of that. But it, you do hit that, I don't know that maybe Wittgensteinian like <laughs> what are we doing this is pointless like yes. no meaning is happening here right and which is referenced in the book too I forget where but like that kind of thing is the kind of thing that I uh, I find that I kind of just my eyes glaze over a bit I'm not really moved by those kind of gestures or that kind of demonstration yeah, I'm 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 not going to sit here and say that I read every word in those 3 pages. Right. Because I didn't. Um but what I will say is that um I th- I believe the only word that is repeated in naming. is naming. Yeah, yeah, and I think that that is I'm not going to say it saved that section which which by the way is is 3 like Matt said 3 pages of the book. But but it, it tasteful it, tasteful in length yeah it, yeah tasteful <laughs> tasteful but bordering on cringe right um it, it really runs up on the cringe limit for me yeah uh, but 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 I do We're think asymptotically <laughs> approaching cringe <laughs> right exactly but I do think it's significant that the only term that it's repeated there is naming because that gets back to the Kripkean concern with um. You know proper names and like how they refer, and sort of uh, the assigning of names being kind of like one of the fundamental human functions. Yes, it's it's an ancient concern. It's a biblical concern, and I think he makes the point of yes. like really emphasizing that so that it's not simply this pointy-headed uh, academic concern, right? Yes, B- because some of the most. Um, like eye glazing moments in in the Bible in the Old Testament are all of those naming sections where it's like X begat Y begat Z begat. That's why you, you know that's what why I mean. The Silmarillion right? is you can't even read the Silmarillion, dude. <laughs> I was just gonna exactly. say, yeah, it's the same shit. It's the, it's the same shit. It's like names the Bible of people. Is the Silmarillion. <laughs> <laughs> So, sure. so, so I do think that's sort of an, uh, uh, an oblique reference in that section. Uh, it, you know, it doesn't mean that I necessarily enjoyed reading those three pages, but I do think that's kind of the, the, the reference that he was going for there. Yeah. And it's not like I don't appreciate that. It's just more like that's one of those, the few things in the book, which overall I'm positive about where I was just like, this wears thin quick. Like this is kind of the thing that I. Yeah. Think. It's like um, Daniel Lewski and 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 like all the crazy like uh, formatting that he does in his books. It's there's a, such a such a fine line between like this is cool and this is uh, annoying as fuck and doesn't really, as far as I'm concerned, service anything in, in in terms of the project that you're working on like yep that i have to rotate the book upside down to like read the word you know what i mean like yeah that's my beef maybe but yeah what 
What else? What else? What else? I, I mean, yeah. Dead I, air. I feel I, I I I feel like there's a lot more. If it, like in, like I feel like we could go on for two or three more hours in terms of like just random little details. Like there's a section where um, someone's name uh, over the course of the section changes between a bunch of different painters, and mm-hmm. and and kind of like trying to analyze that. There's like a bunch of like random um, poetry that's inserted. That I think there's is a, analyzable. There's an increase in in the frequency of photographs, which yes, you know, is is bespeaks the sort of breakdown of language by the end of the book, where you get. I had the Kindle edition, so those photographs looked like absolute dog shit. So they weren't. They looked like they, dog shit in the book too, which is funny. It's funny because you know, when, thing, once, I think maybe intentional because it's about yeah. like the inability of. Even photography, like sort of being behind the lens to capture, because photography being sort of like an analog of language, right? Like that, that, that both language and something as like purportedly objective as photography failing to capture what it suggests that it's able to capture. Well, that, that reminds me of uh, the Museum of Unconditional Surrender, right? That was like a major theme in that postmodern book as well <sighs> so good yeah that was a great book it's so good <laughs> we gotta go back through and redo our ratings we should do that soon that'll be fun for our uh for our year anniversary we might we might do that yeah maybe <laughs> well i mean maybe next month when that might be a good option actually oh yeah when we're all together it's not a bad idea yeah, yeah. spoilers but so yeah, that was that was my read on the uh, photography thing. That it was sort of a, uh, a a shift towards a different mode of expression that equally fails at capturing so, what it purports to capture. The most famous example of like a photography heavy novel is Austerlitz, and like, uh, I don't really want to like. Yeah, I, I'm not going to try and talk about Austerlitz too coherently here, but only to say, like, I don't know if it was intentional or not, but the, the photographs uh, felt silly. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, like, uh, in a way that was not as, I, I, I don't think, overtly um, recognized as in this book, where it's, like, potentially it's, like, so here's a picture of, you know, what what I'm saying. And then sometimes it's like, and then even then it was like, there, there, there's these commentaries right after where it's like, maybe you're not seeing what I'm seeing, but like what I'm seeing is, you know, uh, is this, or I, I don't know. Like the, these photographs are here. It's a c- complete change of medium, uh, but we still ha- we still run into the same problems. And I think that was kind of, what Everett was going for, it's like it was almost like the. Uh, it's been so long since I've written an essay. What? It's not your thesis <laughs> statement, like your closing argument, I guess, or is that like a lawyer term? Yeah, yeah, conclusion, closing argument. Conclusion, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, it's just like. Uh, a photograph should be able to translate. Better than. It's worth a thousand words, bro. Better than language, yeah, 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 exactly. So. Uh, if he can show that it doesn't translate, uh, it feels like a good conclusion to what he was trying to do with language. I think I, I think that's exactly right. That it's like it's, you know, there's there's no way around this uh, prison of language that we're in, right? Like we think we can get out of it with a sort of a, like photographic verisimilitude or whatever, but like the photograph that you take of the thing that you see is never the experience of seeing the thing that you saw when you saw it. You know what I mean? And I think that that, that that's part of what's coming through with the, the photographs. In the... But it's not, it's not a Zeno's paradox kind of nihilism about approaching truth. It's just sort of like, again, because of the, the sort of mention of process philosophy or whatever, um, that that failure and that and then the, the uh, sort of you know platonic sort of ignorance are all uh, are all our sort of encounters with with truth, right? And I guess in a, a get a sort of 
ironically Hegelian sense. Like, um, we have to experience contradictions and limits in order to in order to have an encounter with approximate reality. You know, it, like I if if that's being stated well, I'm I'm not I don't know much about Hegel, but. Yeah, and it also, I don't know, I'm just trying to think a little bit, like, the, you know, the, when you dive through the conglomerate of philosophical information and all this, the, the thread of the story is this father-son relationship, and the, the, the closing lines of the actual book, Gabe said, you know, it made you fucking cry. And I actually reread yep. them, and I was like, yeah, I don't know why I didn't cry the first time, but I was like, mm. <laughs> <laughs> sad. But it's, it's almost like, he be- maybe he believes ever believes that like maybe that is the closest to truth we can actually get to as humans is like uh relationships and personal experiences with other humans it's like the most true maybe maybe not platonic truth but no i, I yeah i think that's right is that the, the 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 truth if there is a thing if there is such a thing as the truth is in the fucking mess like it's in the 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 uh, kind of insane amalgam of memory and narrative and and all of it of course being encased in this inescapable fucking shell of language uh that we can get to something if not truth that something that matters yes is that absurdism gabe uh, yeah maybe kind of. yeah it's 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 about finding meaning in the face of something that is constrictive and or n- negative or something that negates the possibility of meaning. Tragic comic. I always come back to that. I always feel like that's such a good description of of things. And that, but that's not to say unserious, right? Like again, th- this book ultimately is dealing with uh, death. Shout out, Cliff. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh and sex and there's blood. some sex in here too and blood. yeah and 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 coffee and that's the ultimate sort of uh <laughs> whatever the fucking cliche but as they say you know the most the more your eyes roll into the back of your head upon hearing something the more profundity there's probably to be attributed to it um it's a 360 eye roll which means it, really it comes is. back to profundity yeah, I, my eyes roll back forward, but the, you can see a bit of my optic nerve because of how much they've rolled. <laughs> right. I, I, I just want to read the end here because Paul mentioned that it that it it it, it made me tear up a little bit, and it did uh, at the at the end of the book. Um, and 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 again, as I said, like we could go on and on and on and on about these section titles like there's a bunch of shit about crabs and cucumbers at the end like because, Listen, like, i don't fucking know we have know. to in good uh, in a good postmodern mode we got to sort of arbitrarily stop yes, somewhere right, so we we'll do. just do it here we'll so, read the ending okay so the, the final section of the book is called cold are the cucumbers that crawl beneath cucumber i twitch a finger here twitch a finger there fuck with them any way you can i'm dead but they don't know it Forget the adage, let sleeping dogs lie. How about we let sl- dead men die? You hold my hand. I hold your hand. I write this for you. If I wrote, this would be it. If you wrote. Yes. I will always be here. And I. I'm dead, son. I know that, Dad. But I didn't know you knew it. And there's and then there's a picture of this, like, chasm. It's like a Grand Canyon sort of... It's a repetition too. Val- yeah, exactly. Right. And rep yes. And I just fucking Ugh God. This shit hit yeah, me. I, I almost cried just then. I got a little choked up right now. <laughs> this is good. Fuck. I think that, that points to how talented he is talented he is as a prose writer though, is that like I think I wish I remember what author said this, but I remember someone asked him about like the differences between writing prose and writing like poetry. And they were like two different worlds. I don't even try. (laughs) (laughs) And it was like a pretty big author. It might've been Paul Oster. That is probably wrong, but I don't know. Everett is just like, yeah, I I do it. I'm just going to do that too. 
Yeah. yeah. Do it well. It they just, matter. just fuck it. <laughs> just Uber Chad. So, da, na, na. <laughs> no, too soon, dude. <laughs> dude, what do we do? I have yeah, no fuck. I have no. I feel like it's like just this. one if, person. If there's any real. book that we would be justified in skipping this segment for, I think it might be this one. Yeah, this is sort of. I contain yeah. multitudes. I am every house plus. You know. Yeah, that's kind of the point. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I wouldn't even know where to start with the houses. Well, uh, how can you how can you do it when there's passages with people and they literally like change places like quantum right p- humans right you know, <laughs> quantum particle pros. So uh, I I guess quantum maybe uh, in, in a first for the podcast we're gonna skip the Harry Potter segment. Are we all in agreement? Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't even know how to go about doing it. I honestly wouldn't, like genuinely. Like I, I don't know what I would say that would have any relevance to houses or <laughs> J.K. Rowling's yeah. fictional world that she made up that's not Everett's. Yeah. It just like makes me feel icky. Yeah. This book, it makes me feel... Gives I do have... Ache. I'm trying to... I'm, I'm flipping through. I'm trying to find my uh, Scrabble word, though, if anyone has one of those. Oh, I definitely oh, have I, one. I have one that's a funny one. I just want You guys to both go first. Word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna right. to find mine. Paul, go ahead. My word... It's not a great scra- Scrabble word. It's mostly that I was excited that this root word was in this book. It's Gimli. <laughs> <laughs> of course, you dude. That? And you my yes, I did I see it. Like, I did fuck? see it. Yeah, what was that about? Does that mean something other than his a dwarf who's cool? Oh, I can't remember the content. I didn't write it down, or I didn't circle it. I actually didn't want to write in this book when I was reading it because I liked the pages so much. I didn't want. I just didn't want to. That is a problem. If I have a nice copy of something, I I can't write notes in it. I I don't give a shit. I'm yeah, I'm shit. I'm absolutely abusive. Like I'll show it on the screen. Like <laughs> this book is dog-eared to shit, and every fucking page is written on. Yeah, I, domestic abuse essentially. <laughs> Bam, basically. I mean, as bad as the cover of this book is, the pages are just so. I don't know what paper it is. But I just love it. <laughs> I didn't want to dog ear it or anything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 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 trying to find mine. I, sw- I swear I had a good one. Yeah, I had one. It was like some sort of uh, psychosis or something, uh, or neurosis. Ah, now, ah, shit, I'm pissed. I'm pissed, dude. Honestly, I'm pissed. Well, anyway, uh, for people who didn't know, the uh, segment we were in the middle of trying to shore up here is uh, where we try to find a word from the book that either we didn't know or was kind of interesting or, or would serve as a good Scrabble word uh, in terms of point scoring. I found it. Okay. Go off, King. Uh, I didn't even look up what this meant, but uh, extropia. Ooh. That's good. Why don't we check that out right now? Meanwhile, Gabriel, hopefully you've got yours uh, worked out. I, I, I swear to God, I remember uh, circling and dog-earing the page, but it seems to have disappeared. Um. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's check it out. Uh, hold on one second. Extropia. It's a form of strabismus, strabismus being a uh, condition in which the eyes do not properly align with each other when looking at an object, uh, where the eyes are deviated outward. Uh, so, astropia is the opposite. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's like people's eyes going out. You know who is uh, famous, who has it, is uh, Denzel Washington, apparently. <laughs> is that really true? Really? Yep. Okay. I don't, I don't know. They're just I, sort of, go, you're wall-eyed, but for both, you're like a, a, a fucking gecko or something. Yeah. That's epic. Okay, I did find mine. It is... <clears throat> this is on page 158. Brab, I don't even know how to pronounce this. Brab Dingnagian. Oh, Brobignagian. It's from. Yeah. Uh, it's from. Uh, 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 fuck. B R O B. Jonathan Swift. It's it's it's, it's uh, uh, the Gulliver's Travels. It's from Gulliver's Travels. Oh, okay. 
B R O B R O B D I N G N A G I A N. Right. I looked it up and it, it means like basically giant or whatever. Yeah. If you see Lilliputian, it's like the opposite. That word I know, but this one I did not know. Yeah. Same, same, same text reference. Yeah. Fuck that, yeah. That okay. A, sweet. That would be a hard word to write on the Scrabble board. Yeah, it's it, it would be impossible. <laughs> there, you you never even have enough letters. To I forget do that though. Word, bro, 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 dig nagging. Bro, <laughs> dude, I'm telling you, I can't even say it. I don't even know what to say. Brob dig nagnenian or something. <laughs> <laughs> I'm one more time. Wait, one more time. Brob Brob dig nan nagian. <laughs> dude, fuck you. Yeah, I'm shout out Gulliver's no, Travels. You're, you're, just, you're trying like really like in, in good intentions. <laughs> you just can't do it. I uh, I can't do it. Funny. It's impossible. <laughs> There's these horse people Not in that possible. book. Dude, that is this impossible? Called... Dude, impossible is nothing. Uh, him. <laughs> there's a, there's a, these horse people that have a funny name too. That's Brob for me. Ding, <laughs> Nagian. <laughs> Brob Dig Nagian. Yeah, I think yeah. that's right, Matt. I think that's right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> well, well, it's been a pleasure, word. folks. Hey, it's score time, dude. We got to give a score to this book. Yeah, 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 yeah. Dibs not, Paul. Oh, fuck. I get to go last because it's my pick. Yeah. I mean, I really love this book. I, uh, as you can probably tell from my uh, lack of engaging a lot in this podcast, I, a lot of the philosophical discussion just like I didn't went over my head totally. But there's enough so much more that I just loved. Like, you know, I just thought he's really, Everett's like a really engaging writer. I'm really interested to read other books that maybe are just like more linear. Like, I I think probably, I'm just guessing, this would probably be like, people would probably say this is like the worst book to get into Everett with, maybe? Maybe not, I don't know. But I'm sure, like, I'm interested in that Western one, for sure. Um, but I, yeah, I just got the sense from reading this book that I want to read all of his books. I just I'm gonna make that a uh, an effort over the next like ten years or something. Wow, right on. But uh, I think I gotta give it like a pretty high score. I think I'm gonna give it a four point five. Woo! Yeah, I just really holy uh, moly. It's a really good book. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm with you. I I think it's no small task to, uh, hmm. I, well, who I think of is I I really do think of Mackie and and uh, uh, Ugresich, kind of both when I think of this. Yeah. Like, uh, I am very partial and. I forget what I gave you Gresich's book, but something high. And like th- this kind of fragmentary again, like sort of ev- every style and genre kind of approach to trying to get a point across about usually memory, right? Like usually about like right. uh recollection and 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 the kind of sort of the the way in which you, your mind is this palimpsest that uh, creates all these diaphanous layers where I don't know it it, it gets at it gets at a reality it, I think it gets at a reality uh, that um, particularly postmodern literature is is claimed to be avoiding or like evading or, or somehow obscuring. And I, I think that's wrong. And to make that readable and fun uh, <laughs> it's, is uh, huge. I, I had a good time reading this book as well. Huge. Uh, I think Percival Everett is a under-discussed literary talent. I think it might have something to do with how his books look. Uh, so I'm going to give this a 3.8 for me. Nice. Oh yeah. Um yeah, yeah. I mean for me um I'm I'm going to I'm I'm going to break ground 
on the podcast. Mm-hmm. Oh my god! This, what are you doing? This is a five. <laughs> this is this is this is a five point zero Ooh. for me. Um, oh. and I'll, I'll 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 explain why. Um, you must. So, as Paul said, my immediate thought after finishing this book was, I need to read everything else this person has ever written. That was my first fucking thought. And to me, that is a, a, a life-changing moment. Like, it's, it's restructuring my trajectory of, like, what I want to do with my time going forward. I need to read everything else this man's ever written. And, you know, I think um, in, in terms of giving out fives, I'll say this. Five obviously is 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 a thing, but it's also contextual. I don't think this book will be a five for everybody. I I I think there are books that I've read that are like stone cold fives. Everybody needs to read this book. Period. I think the mountain goat, uh, the mountain lion, mountain goat. Sorry. Uh, shout out to John Darnielle. Come on the podcast, please. Um, the mountain lion is, I think, a stone cold five. Everybody regardless of anything should read that book this book is for me contextually today october 28th 2021 a five based on my background my engagement with the philosophy that Everett is talking about and like what the way that it hit me today reading it and talking about it it's a five i i i do not think everybody reading this book will have that experience uh, because I think that that as we've talked about, there's a lot of shit here that is gonna is going to. Um, I, I, there's no way to say this without sounding like an elitist douche, but like there's a lot of shit here that is gonna go over even very smart, engaged people's heads just because they don't have the background. Chill, dude. I no 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 no. I'm not I'm trying joking, to be dick. I'm, I'm just saying. Joking, I'm, joking. I'm just saying like I because of the vagaries of human experience happen to have that background. And for that reason, it hit me in a way that I do not expect that it will hit most people. And that's fine. Um, But for me, this is a sort of a life-changing book. I want to read everything else this guy's written. It makes me rethink my understanding of, like, like we've talked about, difficulty in literature, the concept of postmodernism itself. I think... um, I'm calling out Booktube and Bookstagram and and all of those people. If you're not talking about Percival Everett, you're missing out. You're missing out on some shit. If you're not reading this book and talking about this book, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and Percival Everett, if you so desire, talk to us. That'd be awesome. Yes, I. I mean, as I like, I think me and Paul both said like uh, we're gonna read more of 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 your work and. Uh, well, count me in on that train at the very least. I didn't, yes, you know, I gave the lowest score, but that's not to say. I'm not trying to read other stuff. Jesus. No, 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 no. I, I didn't mean to say that. And as I said, like, there's fives and there's fives, right? Like for me, at this exact like precise moment in my life, given the exact precise context of my background and the shit that I've read this is a five for me this is a five bagger two Plato's yeah (laughs) just on that 3.9 all right bet let's go let's go change change it up (laughs) so uh yeah yeah this is a this is gonna be an important book for me and I also think that um I feel like it. I have to say, and maybe we, maybe it's it's problematic that we're saving this until when no one's listening anymore. But I do think. I mean, we hinted at it at the beginning. I think uh, you know the reason, not the reason, part of the reason people like Everett and uh, Nathaniel Mackey, who's another another one that I want to revisit and think more about. Yeah. You have to factor in the race component, like Matt. You mentioned it's like the the cover looks bad. Yeah, it does, but. 
yeah. I'm not saying I'm not I'm not saying you yeah, I'm not saying you were consciously downplaying it or anything, but like we need to talk about like why black authors are not read and revered in this community in the way because that uh, they 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 just in my opinion objectively should be. Because in case in point, Mackey he gets the good cover. Uh, yeah, he got he the full New Directions. Uh, the yeah. New Directions, yep. basically the book Criterion fucking, <laughs> you know, uh, cover treatment. So it's yes. not yeah, it's not that obviously only. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I'm calling you out, all of you, BookTube, Bookstagram, all you motherfuckers. If you're not reading Percival Everett, you're pooping your pants. That's right. You have diarrhea in your drawers. And it's rolling down your pant legs and it's coming out the bottom and everyone can see it. Yep. It's pooling around your stupid shoes you also bought that aren't good. Your stupid shoes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hey, good night and good luck. Yeah. So that's that. Paul, any final thoughts? Uh, I just realized on the back of the book in his picture, he's got a crow on his shoulder. Did you guys notice that? Yeah, I did, dude. It's epic. <laughs> crow or raven? It, like, Maybe, I hope, yeah, it's probably a raven. But it like blended into the background, but now I'm looking at it, I'm like, that's fucking sweet. What a cool guy. Damn. Edgar Allan wow. Crow. Edgar Allan Crow. Edgar Everett. Crow. No. <laughs> we can't say that. Fuck. But 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 <laughs> but something we could talk about, though, to be honest, though, is is the commentary, I mean, just based on what I just said, you know. The commentary on blackness, right? That it fades into the background, and that it, it, oh, a, yeah. a, as a sort of thing that's in the image, but and this goes back to the stuff in the book about photography, uh, mm. that it doesn't actually capture what's there fully, right? Like I'm sure the person that's there saw the crow sitting on his fucking shoulder, but in the picture, doesn't really show up. I think there's like there's also like a weird, like there's or the raven, weird. whatever the fuck. There's definitely like a uh, a race factor for sure, and th- uh, there's also a factor of like some difficult books seem to be the not not to be the uh, the kind of difficult books that people like want to fit into their little category. You know? Yes, like, dude. Uh, people will like read Base Cathedral and just be like, just like write it off in a weird way. Like this is not difficult in the way that I want it to be. It's like weird. <laughs> Yo, I honestly think this is I honestly think this is a really important point, Paul. Like it's like, oh, difficult means um oh, it's it, it contains a lot of terms that I have to look up or whatever or it, it's, it's, it's which I think base cathedral even meets that standard, but it's the rough and dirty assessment of like difficult means length plus uh, vocabulary vocabulary yeah, yeah straight up yeah which i think like to defend mcelroy a little bit like cannonball at least for me definitely bucked that definition because 100%. i i didn't have to look up a single fucking word in that book and it's not it's per- proof positive yeah but that's and not it's not yeah. particularly long um but that shit was fucking hard to read i still have exactly yeah. about it but I think this book touches on another kind of dimension of quote unquote difficulty, which is that like, if you're talking about, you know, you, you hear people talk about like Joyce or whatever, and like you have to know about, uh, you know, mm-hmm. in, Indo-European mythology or like whatever the fuck to understand you, Ulysses or whatever. Okay, great. But um, in order to understand this book, you have to read Naming and Necessity and Frega, which is like arguably significantly more difficult in terms of background knowledge than what you would need to do to understand Ulysses. Yeah, it's got the it's got the modernist uh the typically modernist uh pedigree where you where you, you yeah, like you said, it's a postmodern text but it's described by the maybe author as modernist and it has a modernist thing of like an assumption of your familiarity through prior forms of education with the ancient Greeks. And, uh, you know, you know what I mean? Like, uh, definitely canonical shit to, for lack of a better word. 
But in this, it's not the canon canonical shit. It's it's just sort of like the assumption of an education that is in hi highly specialized. I mean, yeah, dude. Like, I mean, I, I, I referenced I referenced this earlier, but I, I, like, this is all uh, bonus content that we're still recording. But like. There are some fucking deep ass fucking cuts in here, dude. Uh, the, so there's a, a section title that's um, "Is Semantics Possible?" That's the title of a Hillary Putnam article from Metaphilosophy, <laughs> which is an academic journal. Hillary Putnam is uh, one of the sort of other most well known uh, contemporary analytic philosophers. He he had a beef with Richard Rorty. And he wrote an article called Is Semantics Possible in Metaphilosophy Volume... I looked this shit up. Metaphilosophy Volume 1, Number 3 in 1970. And Everett uses that as the title for one of his subsections. And so, like, there's there's a bunch... Of, and that's not the only example, but there's a bunch of, like, weird-ass deep cuts where Everett is clearly reading obscure but important philosophy and and again getting back to my score that's the shit that fucking like affects me in my specific in 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 my specificity we'll put it that way yeah well i think you, you've justified your five i'm i'm totally on board i mean yeah before you even said your explanation i was like it just makes sense to me because it's like it's the uh quintessential fiction book for you in a lot of ways you know like combining yeah everything that you're interested in right it's like squid game right it's like uh y y you've got your your classic you've got your 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 social ill you've got your more traditional narrative peppered with violence and familial drama and then you've got your theory to structure it <laughs> What if the final game in Squid Game was you have to read Percival Everett by Virgil Russell <laughs> and decipher every single... And have the right clue. score. <laughs> oh, <Yeah>. shit. <laughs> That's fucking season two, dude, of Squid Game. Yeah. <laughs> it's not kid stuff anymore. <laughs> All right, y'all. Deuces. All right. It was a pleasure to speak to my friends <laughs> and also <laughs> the uh, always theoretical audience. Yes. We love you. Subscribe to the Patreon. Subscribe to the YouTube, uh, Instagram, Twitter. It's all just spinecrackers. Find it. Mm. You're smart people. Yeah. Come on now. <laughs>